Welcome to AEI in this morning's event, addressing the underlying causes of the banking crisis of 2023. I'm Paul Kupiak, a senior fellow here at AEI. In June 2017, then Chair, Fed Chair Janet Yellen said that because of enhanced Dodd-Frank regulation, she did not believe there would be a new financial crisis in her lifetime. Recently, on several occasions, Fed Chair Powell and Vice Chair Barr echoed Secretary Yellen's assurance that the banking system is sound and well capitalized. These official statements notwithstanding, at the direction of the Biden administration's Financial Stability Oversight Council, or FSOC, the Federal Reserve launched a project to engineer new climate change stress test capital requirements for the largest banks. Stress tests are the preferred tool of opaque stealth regulators. Banking agencies can use the results of hypothetical modeling exercises to acquire banks to do the administration's bidding under the guise that regulators are preventing imaginary risks that will never materialize. Before March 8th, addressing real or imaginary climate change, banking risks was the job one of the Biden administration's, was job one on the Biden administration's Fed honey-do list. New climate change capital requirements and reinstating Dodd-Frank's enhanced regulations for global systemically important banks for smaller banks was the reason for the Vice Chair, Vice Chair Barr's holistic review of bank capital requirements. I do not recall the FSOC identifying interest rate risk or contagious bank runs as a systemic risk worthy of concern in their most recent report. In a speech here at AEI in December, Vice Chair Barr said bank capital is strong, but in during our review, we should and are being humble about our ability to predict how a future financial crisis might unfold etc. That humility, that skepticism, would serve us well in crafting a capital framework that is enduring and effective. Unfortunately, the Fed got a heaping serving of humble pie in March, and then again in April, when like so many Fed assurances, its forecast of banking resilience turned out to be optimistic. Regulators were forced to invoke emergency systemic risk powers to contain contagious bank runs. So far as I'm aware, no one has cited climate change as a proximate cause when they declared this to be a systemic risk event. What went wrong? Was it a failure of monetary policy, supervision, regulation? What changes, if any, are needed? There's so many things to talk about. Fed Vice Chair of Supervision Michael Barr spearheaded the Fed's review of the SVB bank failure. In contrast to most federal agencies, the Fed does not have an independent inspector general to examine its mistakes. The Fed has its own board-appointed IG office, and the GAO has some investigative powers, but these arrangements fall short of the investigative powers of a truly independent IG. The Fed's extensive report on the failure of SVB leans heavily on the in innuendo that while imposing the regulatory tapering requirements of S-2155, the 2018 Economic Growth Regulatory Relief and Consumer Protection Act, then Vice Chair Quarles seriously mucked up the Federal, Board, the Federal Reserve Board's supervision oversight process. The way I see it, S-2155 had nothing to do with the failures of SVP, Signature, or First Republic Bank. Federal banking regulators have ample powers under prompt corrective action rules and legislation to remedy any serious safety and soundness issues they identified. The Federal Reserve Board stress test would not have identified interest rate risk as a major issue because the, stress, the Fed's stress scenario for the next banking apocalypse was a steep recession with declining interest rates. None of the institutions that have failed thus far were part of a complex holding company, so little would have been gained from the Dodd-Frank living will requirements. Given the concentration of uninsured deposit fundings in these institutions, the liquidity risks were obvious for months based on the regulatory call report data banks report quarterly. As for blaming the former vice chair Quarles, according to all news reports I have read, Michael Barr became the chairman of supervision on July 19th, 2022. Instead of launching his crusade to conquer non-existent bank climate change risk in his holistic capital crusade, taxpayers would have been much better served had Mr. Barr focused on assessing less fanciful risks like interest rate and liquidity risk. The failures occurred on Vice Chair Barr's watch, and he owns them. The FDIC does not escape blame for the Signature Bank, SVB, or First Republic Bank failures. The FDIC was the primary federal regulator for both Signature and First Republic Bank. The FDIC is also proud of its backup authority, 
a power it has to participate in any bank examination, regardless of the bank's primary federal regulator, and in special circumstances to conduct an independent exam should the FDIC deem the bank or a holding company to pose a material risk to the deposit insurance fund. SPV is an example of a situation for which the FDIC's backup authority was designed. I see no evidence mentioned that the FDIC pushed back on the Fed's lack of vigor in enforcing prop corrective actions, even though the FDIC's early warning models must have identified SVB Bank as a glowing red risk. The FDIC suggests that signature bank failure in part owed to staffing shortages at the FDIC's New York regional office. It seems that examiners avoided the New York office because of its high cost of living, and I'm guessing less travel per diem, as supervisors, as supervised banks were mostly within commuting distance of the, of the New York office. FDIC examiners are well paid, but legendary for their frugality on the road. They view saved per diem dollars as a sort of bonus for the job. Without the travel, FDIC headquarters jobs in DC were more attractive. If there is no free breakfast, airline, car rental, or motel bonus points, better to take a job in, G in DC and work from home during COVID. We have yet to hear the FDIC's explanation for the failure of First Republic Bank. That'll be, we'll wait and see that. Given the post-2008 changes in the way the Federal Reserve implements monetary policy, the FDIC is perhaps the only party that in theory might keep the Fed and the OCC bank supervisors on the straight and narrow. But recent events demonstrate the wisdom of, the wisdom of a famous Yogi Berra-ism. In theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. The Fed's adoption of a corridor operating system and QE resulted in the Fed paying interest on an enormous amount of excess reserves. This destroyed the federal funds market. Banks used to lend excess reserves amongst themselves. These uncollateralized loans left banks at risk should a borrower default. Banks used to monitor each other for signs of weakness and distress. A bank's inability to borrow fed federal funds was an early warning, signaling distress before the federal bank supervisors on the case finished their second free breakfast donut at the Hampton Inn. Central counterparty clearing and derivative contracts work in tandem with Fed monetary operating policy to greatly diminish bank incentives to surveil the creditworthiness of other banks. So today, more than ever, we have to rely on bank regulators to assess the risk of banks. Speaking of interest rate risk, it's astonishing that the Federal Reserve Board could be blind to interest rate risk in the banks it supervises when the Federal Reserve system itself has experienced a $1 trillion loss an unrealized loss, and it's held to maturity portfolio, and the Fed is experiencing roughly $9 billion a month in actual cash operating losses. You see, similar to some of the banks regulators supervise, the Fed is paying a higher interest rate on the money it borrowed to buy its $8.1 trillion worth of securities in its portfolio than the yield, that portfolio, and the yield on the securities in that portfolio. Federal bank examiners had plenty of warning and their extensive powers could have been used to preemptively de-risk SVB. The same is true of the FDIC at Signature and First Republic Bank, but for whatever reason, federal bank supervisors did not exercise these powers. My experience suggests that bank supervisors are reluctant to impose sanctions before being able to point to evidence of actual realized losses. Maybe this played a role. So many things to talk about here, just a few words about the actual bank resolutions. Because of simultaneous failures of SVB and Signature Bank spark runs at other regional banks, many of which had large unrecognized mark-to-mark -mark losses on their held to maturity securities, the Federal Reserve Board, the FDIC Board, and Secretary Yellen all agreed to invoke a systemic risk exception for these two banks and apply an FDIC blanket guarantee on all deposits in these banks, regardless of deposit size. In addition, Secretary Yellen inferred that there would, they would apply the blanket deposit guarantee to other banks if, if authorities deemed it necessary. Under normal rules, SVB and Signature Bank could have been resolved without any losses to the Federal Deposit Insurance Fund, zero losses. The blanket deposit guarantee raised the SVB resolution cost to at least 20 billion, and it cost the Signature Bank rescue something like 2 billion. The FDC, FDIC is now debating how it's going to recoup these losses uh, and for some reason, they think the large banks should pay, even though the large banks had nothing to do, do with these two bank failures. The three, fi the three failed F bank FDIC receiverships are now borrowing well over $100 billion from the Federal Reserve, which is highly unusual, to say the least. 
I'm guessing it is because the debt, debt ceiling precludes the FDIC from borrowing from the US Treasury as it usually does. But no one, no one in Congress has yet grilled the regulators on this anomaly as far as I know. Post Dodd-Frank Act, a systemic risk exception was supposed to trigger the use of the FDIC's new orderly liquidation authority, where, for example, the FDIC would have taken over the SVB holding company, cancel its equity and bonds, and liquidate its assets to keep the SVB bank open and operating. For some unspoken reason, the government did not use OLA. It does not even appear to have been discussed as an option. Just a few weeks ago, the Biden administration's FSOC voted to revisit the rules for designating non-bank financial institutions as systemically important so large non-bank institutions could be added to the Fed's GSIB supervision portfolio. The more regulators mess up, the more powers they say they are, are needed to do their job. I have touched on a lot of issues very quickly here because we have truly have four truly accomplished banking and monetary policy ex experts with us today who are going to go in depth on some of the issues I just mentioned. In the order in which they will be speaking, they are Bill Nelson, Executive Vice President and Chief Economist at the Bank Policy Institute, Charles Calamaris, who will be joining us virtually, who is Henry Coffin Professor of Financial Institutions at Columbia University, Alex Pollock, Senior Fellow at Mises Institute, and Andy Levin, a professor at Dartmouth College. Each of these gentlemen are exceptionally well qualified to speak on today's topic. Their bios are lengthy, and I encourage, I encourage you to review them using the links provided in today's online event announcement. Bill, the podium is yours. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Paul. So is there something that I can use to go through my slides? And we'll slide, yeah, perfect, thank you. All right. Paul, thank you for having me, and I really appreciate it. To the American Enterprise Institute as well, and I appreciate being on this panel with these extraordinary uh, other economists. So we're here today to talk about the underlying causes of the banking crisis of 2023. Uh, what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to focus on SVB. That's the institution I know the most about. Uh, and I'm going to start with some big picture observations, uh, then turn to uh, supervision and regulation problems, including the bar report. Uh, and then move after the bar report to the crisis response of the government, including the discount window and systemic risk exception, lender of last resort, uh, and end with some thoughts about monetary policy and how it may have contributed to, the, to this crisis. And there's going to be a lot of overlap between what I said and, and what Paul said. So before we jump into this, just a couple of things that have struck me over the last few months. So in each of the bank failures that happened in the... Uh, the the, there were losses on due to rapid increases in interest rates combined with um, unstable funding, which interacted to lead to the failure. But these weren't exactly an insolvency event, nor were they exactly an illiquidity event. Normally, we're taught and we think that gains on a deposit franchise help offset losses on longer-term fixed-race assets when interest rates go up because deposit rates tend to lag behind the rises in other interest rates. But that's only true if the deposits actually remain in the bank. When they flee, you're left with the losses on the other, uh, the other securities and then become insolvent. And as a result, there's actually a, an incentive to flee sort of standard diamond dig uh, dynamics involved. And there have been a couple of uh, excellent uh, papers written recently on this, uh, this perception, uh, this, uh, this correct, I think, conception of what happened, which I've provided in, the, in my remarks there. Uh, the other issue is that we all know that investing in longer term, illiquid long term assets uh, and funding it with runnable liabilities is unstable. Uh, but normally we worry about the shadow banking system for this reason. And that's because we've all been taught that, we all thought that, that this problem had been fixed for banks. That's where it starts. Bank risk is managed by deposit insurance, by having a lender of last resort, and by regulation and supervision. And uh, all of these things broke down in the last couple months. So before uh, diving into this, I have to give a, little, a few words on how unrealized losses and gains on uh, securities are treated on the bank's books. So banks can keep uh, securities in three places, trading account, their investment account as held to maturity, and their investment account as available for sale. For trading account securities, unrealized losses and gains pass through income 
and the securities are valued at market. They're valued at fair value. For investment account securities that are held to maturity, uh, for all investment account securities, the gains and losses do not pass through income. For held to maturity securities, uh, they're valued at par. For available for sale securities, they're valued at fair value or at market, except for regulatory purposes. For regulatory purposes, they're treated at par, unless you're a GSIB, in which case they're treated at market. And this exclusion from that market value treatment is what's called the AOCI filter, which you might hear about. Okay, so Silicon Valley Bank. Silicon Valley Bank is a bank that had tripled in size over the previous three years. There's always a red flag when you follow banks. Uh, it, it took deposits from venture capitalists, from the firms of venture capitalists, and from private equity, and 95% of its deposits were uninsured. It invested those uh, funds in longer-term treasuries and agency MBS. Those made up more than half of their assets. About 58% of their assets were, were uh, what qualify as HQLA. However, and they were valued at par, but when you looked at the mark-to-market losses on those securities, those were actually approximately equal to the capital of the institution. Now, over the preceding year or so, the decline in the venture capital industry, and therefore the decline in the deposits of the, fun of the firms funded by the venture capital industry, um, led, contributed to funding problems at Silicon Valley Bank. And on March 8th, to address those problems, it sold basically all of its available for sale portfolio of securities, booking losses. Now, it was supposed to simultaneously raise capital when it did that, but the capital raise failed. And this alarmed their depositors. The next day, on uh, March 29th, uh, March 9th, rather, $42 billion of deposits left the institution. And the following day, Friday, March 10th, when they closed the institution, there was $100 billion, more than almost half the assets of the institution, $100 billion in deposits in the queue to flee that morning. Uh, so the state of California and the FDIC closed the institution. They actually closed it after its offices opened on the East Coast, but before the offices opened on the, on the, the West Coast. So how did this happen? Well, first and foremost, bank, the bank's risk management was awful. Dealing with interest rate risk and having a stable funding profile is, is banking 101, and they, they failed banking 101. Uh, but also, capital requirements largely ignore interest rate risk. The risk weights on assets uh, don't depend on fixed rate, a fixed rate assets, don't depend upon the maturity of the asset at all. Moreover, liquidity requirements focus on stockpiling HQLA, stockpiling liquid assets. And they don't focus, like they did before the global financial crisis, on having a diversified and reliable sources of funding. So this actually just creates an incentive to accumulate government debt. And you can accumulate long-term debt if you wish. Uh, and the bank was actually awash in liquidity, as I mentioned. Then lastly, examiners focused on process. They issued dozens of mandates to the bank on things like vendor management and IT infrastructure. So at the end of last month, uh, the Federal Reserve issued a report uh, on its supervision of SVB. Uh, and it was uh, overseen by, by Chair Barr, Chair for Supervision, uh, and it's therefore called the Barr Report. So the report uh, is limited to events up to March 8th. So it doesn't assess the, or discuss the government's response to the, to the crisis. The report also doesn't discuss how interest rate and funding risk uh, were handled by other supervisors at other banks or by uh, other banking agencies. But SVB was, was supervised exclusively by the Federal Reserve. So it, so it wasn't a horizontal review like the, like the Fed likes. And it didn't provide any, any internal communications between, between the Fed and among the Fed staff. It just provided the formal communications from the, from the Fed to SVB and correspondences with SVB. So at the very end of the report, if you have the stamina to make it to page 96, you, there, it does list some things that seem quite uh, appropriate given the material that was released on supervisory material. In particular, it, 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 it says, as things for consideration, that maybe supervisors should focus more on fundamental risk and a little bit less on process. Uh, but these issues were not mentioned in the, in the key takeaways. So the report prominently at the beginning has four key takeaways. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank's board and management failed to manage their risks. Uh, supervisors didn't fully appreciate the extent of the vulnerabilities of, of SVB as it grew. Uh, 
when the supervisors did identify the vulnerabilities, they didn't take sufficient steps to ensure that Silicon Valley Bank fixed those problems quickly enough. These things seem undeniable. Uh, the last of the four key takeaways, which is what I'm going to discuss, and, and as Paul mentioned, is that the board's tailoring approach in response to Agrippa in 2019 uh, and a shift in the stance of supervisory policy impeded effective supervision by reducing standards, increasing complexity, and promoting a less assertive federal uh, supervisory approach. So SBB's failure was not caused by a lax supervisory culture or the tailoring of regulations. So there's an old joke uh, about uh, an outgoing president giving an incoming president uh, three envelopes to open when he encounters some difficulties. And the Barr report effectively combines the first of the two envelopes, which is blame your predecessor and then blame the Fed. Uh, so uh, notably, the last envelope is prepare three envelopes. Uh, so, to, so to start with, examiners were not less assertive. Uh, at the end of 2022, there were 30, the, the Fed had issued 30 matters requiring attention and matters requiring immediate attention. Uh, and now six of these were directly related to liquidity risk, and one concerned the management of interest rate risk, but the other 23 were on things like IT infrastructure and you know, uh, money laundering issues and fiduciary risk management. Um, and if you look only at the 12 MRIAs, the matters that were most urgent at that time, only two dealt with liquidity risk and none addressed interest rate risk. So the, man, the, the supervisors were plenty assertive, it's just not, they just weren't assertive about the right things. So SVB's failure was also not caused by a tailoring of regulations. S2155 required the Fed to tailor re regulations of regional and smaller banks. The failure wasn't caused by the tailoring of capital regulations. Now, tailoring allowed the, the SVB to exclude losses on its AFS securities from regulatory capital. But SVB would have passed pre-tailoring risk-based capital requirements by a wide margin. And it would have had a 10% CET1 ratio versus a 7% requirement. The tailoring of stress tests did not cause the problem. Now, it's true that tailoring excluded SVB from stress tests, and they were going to be on a biannual schedule starting in 2024. But SVB would have performed very well uh, on the Fed's stress test. As, as Paul mentions, the stress tests contemplate a severe recession where interest rates fall. And they don't evaluate in any way funding stability. Uh, but even if interest rates were to rise in the Fed scenario and banks were required to hold to, to recognize losses on AFS securities, SVB would have been fine because most of its securities were in held to maturity. And then lastly, only a third of SVB's assets were loans. So its loan losses would have been low. And that's the normal mechanism through which a stress test uh, imposes stress. SVB's failure was not caused by the tailoring of liquidity requirements. Now, the tailoring excluded SVB from the liquidity coverage ratio and the net stable funding ratio. Uh, but SVB would have passed the net stable funding ratio. These are the Fed's calculations. Uh, it would have needed $8 billion more uh, of HQLA, high quality liquid assets, to pass the LCR. But as I noted, SVB uh, was awash in liquid assets. They could have passed simply by increasing a little more in, of their investments in longer-term treasuries uh, and Ginnie Mays and reducing their investments in Fannies and Freddies. They wouldn't have had to add any assets, just a slight change in the, in the flow of investments as they expanded. Moreover, SVB was required to conduct internal liquidity stress tests, which tend to be at least as strict as the LCR, and then report those results to their supervisors. They had to do this quarterly. Uh, you know, reflecting that stringency of, of ILSTs, SVB was consistently failing its own tests. And the report finds that the Fed examiners did not respond appropriately. And then lastly, the tailoring of resolution uh, requirements didn't contribute to the, to, the, to the failure or the messiness of the failure either. So absent tailoring, SVB uh, would have been subject to holding company level resolution requirements. But they were subject to bank level resolution requirements. The bank made up 98% of their assets. Uh, and the bar report doesn't actually discuss in any way how the resolution planning problem, uh, tailoring uh, contributed to the failure. So just a couple final thoughts on the bar report. First, to me, as I read it, the policy recommendations in the report 
seemed a little different from what Vice Chair Barr would have recommended prior to the failure, as he'd, uh, the things that he'd recommended pub publicly. And, and related to this, within the next month or two, the Fed is going to come out with a big capital proposal. Uh, it's the finalization of, of Basel III or, or Basel IV, depends on what you want to call it. Uh, but when you read it through, you'll see that it's about market risk, operational risk, and credit risk. I'm speaking now. Uh, SBP was about interest rate risk and liquidity risk. There's no overlap whatsoever. Um, okay, so turning past the bar report, what not, not covered by the bar report, the government's response uh, to this failure. So first, uh, normally when a bank fails, it is quickly sold so that it can keep operating, preserving its franchise value. But the FDIC is required to resolve a bank in the least costly manner. And when only 5% of your deposits are insured, the least costly manner is liquidation. But liquidation is incredibly disruptive to the financial system. And clearly the FDIC and the Fed and Treasury were, were very concerned about contagion to the rest of the banking, of banking system. As a result, they invoked the systemic risk exception to least cost resolution. And they stepped in and guaranteed all of the deposits of SBB and Signature Bank, and essentially promised to do so uh, to do the same if necessary if other banks failed. Now the FDIC then sought a buyer, but the efforts appeared to have been bungled. So according to Bloomberg, the effort to wind down Silicon Valley Bank was marred by an unmotivated seller, infighting between regulators, and ultimately a failed option. The government also responded, the Federal Reserve, as a lender of last resort. According to the report, SVB had insufficient, probably none, no collateral pre-positioned at the discount window. Normally banks pre-position loans and other securities at the discount window to, to be prepared to borrow. And they'd never conducted a test borrowing. Consequently, they had $20 billion in collateral that was trapped at the FHLB that wasn't being used. It was probably trapped because the FHLBs take a blanket lien as their way of securing collateral against all bank assets. Now the Fed and the FHLB normally work out you know, in a case-by-case -case basis, a carve-out for the Fed to get assets, but that takes time. Uh, they also had $20 billion in collateral uh, that was um, at their custodian the day before they failed, that they were unable to get to the Fed. The SVB had also not signed up for the Fed's new lending program, the Standing Repo Facility, uh, where they could have repoed their treasuries or their, or their agency MBS. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the SRF because it, it doesn't actually, the, the discount window does everything that the SRF does, and it does a lot of other things. So it's, it's not really actually um, that relevant. But it's important, they, they, could have, they, they could have signed up for it, and they chose it. <laughs> but perhaps most importantly, if SVB had simply borrowed against those assets that it sold on March 8th at the discount window, instead of selling the securities, this entire banking crisis could, pro could possibly have been avoided. Now, the Fed didn't just lend to SVB in the response to the failure. It also conduct, engaged in some other broader lending things, for lending operations. So for one thing, it opened the Bank Term Funding Program, which is a, uh, it extends one-year loans at a low fixed rate, repayable without penalty. Its rate's actually so low that right now you can get one of these loans, deposit the proceeds at the Fed, and earn considerably more in interest from the, from the Fed than you're paying on the loan. And if the, the Fed lowers the rate that it's paying on deposits, you can just repay the loan without penalty at that time. Now, remarkably, under this program, the Fed led up to par value on the loans, uh, on the securities, on the treasuries and agency securities, even though the, the securities themselves have market values that are far below par. So that means that the Fed is lending more than the collateral, the value of the collateral that it's received. And the treasuries provided $25 billion uh, in credit guarantees to the, to the Fed using the Exchange Stabilization Fund for the program. But the Fed also lent to the bridge banks of SBB and to Signature and to the receiver for First Republic. And since those two bridge banks are now, it's lending to the receiver for all of those things. The receiver is the FDIC. Now, normally, under a standing arrangement that's been there for decades, the FDIC repays any outstanding loans to the, that were made to a bank when the bank fails and then the Fed surrenders the collateral that it had received so the, the FDIC can get on with the resolution. 
the Fed is lending $228 billion to the FDIC as receiver right now. That's twice the peak primary credit, what we normally call discount window credit, that was lent in the global financial crisis. And very unusually, uh, although the Fed has a reputation to be secretive, it's actually very transparent about its lending. It almost always immediately publishes all the terms and everything. They've published nothing uh, on these loans. We don't, know that we don't know anything about the terms of these loans. And I'd note that yesterday the Fed released its financial stability report. The report includes an entire section on how the Fed responded to, this, to these events, including a discussion of bank term funding program and including a discussion of how the regular discount window was used it has no mention whatsoever about this lending, even though it right now makes up 73% of the loans that the Fed responded in response to this crisis. Let me, let me end with a couple of remarks on how the FOMC uh, shares some responsibility for these events. So a lot of commentators have pointed out that the Fed should have at least been best, should have been best placed to warn banks about interest rate risks. But this actually misses the point. Interest rates rose so much and so quickly because the Fed was behind the curve. Now, this is partly because of an inflation surprise, which was no fault of the Fed's. But it was also, in many ways, was. The Fed was in many ways at fault. I count about 13 ways. Uh, but those include a massive asset purchase program that was very slow to stop and being unwilling to raise the federal fund rate until it had finished uh, tapering its purchases. Overly strong forward guidance that tied the Fed's hands uh, to not begin tightening until it had reached its inflation and unemployment goals. And mismeasuring the neutral rate of interest, the interest rate above which policy is tight and below which policy is easy, uh, and therefore by how much policy needed to be tightened. This last mistake contributed to the market's misperception of how high interest rates would need to go. So in 2022, the Fed kept telling the market it was heading to 2.5% because 2.5% was neutral, it asserted. Now, the FOMC estimates the real, federal, the real neutral federal funds rate to be 1.5%. The neutral nominal federal, nominal federal funds rate is the neutral real federal funds rate plus the underlying rate of inflation or near-term inflation expectations, which are not directly observable. But the Fed was pointing to 2.5% because its long-run target for inflation was 2%. That's clearly the wrong concept when inflation is running at 8%. So for example, in the, in the July 22 post-meeting FOMC conference, Chair Powell said, so I guess I'd start by saying, we've been saying we would move expeditiously to get to the range of neutral, and I think we've done that now. We're at two and a quarter to two and a half, half, and that's right in the range of what we think is neutral. Now a couple months before that, in, in one of my commentaries, I pointed out, now at that point it was it was clear that two and a half was above where they were. So what I pointed out was that none of this matters for signaling the direction of policy over the next few meetings. But it matters a lot for thinking about what are reasonable levels right now for medium and longer term interest rates. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Charlie? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, it would be good if I could get you to give me a thumbs up from the podium, Paul, if, if you can hear me. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Thank you very much. So, unfortunately, I can't hear you, and I haven't been able to hear the presentations by Bill and Paul that preceded me. I apologize for that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and present, nonetheless, and I, if there's any overlap uh, with the prior speakers, you'll have to bear with me. The title of my presentation today is Bank Distress is a Symptom of Three Policy Framework Failures. And what I want to do is first outline what I think are the obvious, severe uh, policy framework failures that the current banking distress is really showing us, and then talk about obvious remedies for those. And I want to emphasize I'm, I'm not going into a lot of technical details uh, in my presentation because I think that what's so striking to me is how obvious the policy failures have been and 
how simple the remedies are. And in fact, many of these remedies we've been talking about since the 1980s. I won't go into the deeper explanation of why haven't we fixed this since the 1980s, except to say that I think that there are deep political problems, both in bank regulation and in the governance of monetary policy that are preventing us from fixing uh, the policy frameworks of monetary policy, regulatory policy, and supervisory policy. And you know, that, that's a deeper problem, but it's a very real one because nothing that I'm going to be talking about today is particularly new. Um, and yet the banking crisis that we're going through right now, which is new, um, is reflecting those unaddressed policy failures that have been going on for many decades now. So let, let me uh, begin. Um, the first category of policy failures is monetary policy. Uh, we're in a very different place in terms of monetary policy from where we were as of 2006. Uh, I want to emphasize two different aspects of this policy framework that are creating problems in monetary policy. First, because we're in a research, uh, a reserve rich environment, that is banks have been encouraged through QE policy and various other monetary policies to hold huge amounts of excess reserves. Um, and, and we've gotten rid of any reserve requirements on banks. So banks are holding huge uh, reserves as a fraction of their balance sheet. We're now in an environment where banks never borrow from each other reserves, almost never. And now Viralacharya and Raghurajan have pointed out that this creates a problem of sudden liquidity shocks that has uh, you know, come about as a result of the fact that we don't have a functioning interbank market for reserves because we've switched monetary policy from a the, the pre-2007 system of an active federal funds market where reserves were scarce and banks were regularly borrowing from each other to one in which we don't have banks borrowing from each other. And then we have periodic uh, stress in the uh, liquidity scarcity, which we can't address because we don't have an active market. I want to point to another problem which is that the banks are not borrowing from each other on an unsecured basis. The repos are secured loans, and you don't have to know anything about the counterparty risk of your counterparty in a repo to be comfortable lending against, let's say, treasury securities. The thing that was distinctive about the federal funds market is that it required intermediaries to lend to each other on an unsecured, non-collateralized basis which meant they had to be conversant about the counterparty risk of their counterparty, which meant they cared about whether banks were teetering on the brink of insolvency. And banks therefore faced discipline coming from the existence of the interbank market, as well as uninsured deposits, but especially the interbank market, because those are very informed counterparties. And so that has disappeared. And I think that that has been an important contributor to the lack of market discipline on, on banks. That is, if banks are teetering on the brink of insolvency, it used to be, let's say, that long before you would have gotten quite to the point of insolvency, if you were doing something obvious, that is, experiencing large losses on your securities, and those large losses were putting you into a vulnerable position, your counterparties in the interbank market would have let you know that they were worried about it, and they would have themselves uh, reacted to your problem. We don't have that reaction anymore. A second flaw in the monetary policy framework is we have a very confusing framework, which means that it, it was very difficult for banks to realize that the Fed's fight against inflation was going to take the form of a sudden and large increase in interest rates, which created, of course, their fundamental problem. Why is the monetary policy so confusing? Well, first of all, we don't have a systemic, uh, a systematic, I meant to say, monetary policy framework uh, that's understood. So from roughly 1992 till about 2004, the Fed seemed to be following a very well understood policy framework, some kind of a Taylor rule, as uh, Federal Reserve Board economists at that time had elucidated. And furthermore, there was only one Fed monetary target 
uh, the Fed funds rate. And the Fed was achieving that only with uh, changing its open market operations for purchasing treasury bills. That was a very simple and understandable monetary policy framework. And people could anticipate pretty well what the Fed was going to do. But that disappeared in 2000, I would say 2004, certainly by 2007. Now the Fed has multiple interest rates that it controls, not just the repo rate, since the federal funds market doesn't exist anymore, not just the repo rate that it targets, but also interest on reserves. And it isn't really clear from any one interest rate what the Fed is targeting. The Fed also has been pursuing policy through QE, and it regularly tells us that its decisions to increase or decrease its on balance sheet holdings are effectively have equivalent decisions to an interest rate decision. But there's no overall measure of the stance of monetary policy that anyone can point to. And furthermore, the Fed isn't just holding treasury bills, it's engaged in all sorts of activities. And you might say, well, why is the Fed doing this, confusing mishmash of different interest rates and different kinds of activities? The answer is that the Fed, since the crisis of 2007 to 2009, has evolved into a fiscal authority, not really a monetary authority anymore. It wants to do things like target the mortgage market independently. And so it uses uh, purchases of mortgage-backed securities to try to favor the mortgage market. Uh, interest on reserves is used to constrain, for example, when you increase the interest rate on reserves, constrain the expansionary effects of their on balance sheet um, acquisitions through QE, which are favoring the mortgage market, but to constrain those effects on commercial lending. So the Fed is basically operating a bunch of subsidies for different markets um, off of these various policies that are targeting different interest rate spreads including repo spreads, sometimes targeted to help money market mutual funds. So the Fed has evolved quite inappropriately as a fiscal authority, which is why it uses all these different tools. But it means that no one really has an idea. You can't look at the Fed's actions and be able to come up with an overall summary. What is its strategy? What, are, what is its stance? Where is it headed? And so these, these two problems, the lack of an interbank uh, non-secured market, for disciplining bank risk taking and the absence of any systematic framework or even predictable understanding of what the stance of monetary policy is or what it will evolve to are a huge framework error that, that, that has contributed to our problem. Moving on to regulatory policy framework, the key problem has been the reliance on misleading book value. Now that's done both uh, in two ways. First of all, the bank's securities holdings are being valued if those securities are part of the hold to maturity uh, bundle within the bank. They're being valued at their face value at the time, let's say, that they were purchased, um, they're, they're valued at the time they were purchased, rather than at their current market value. And that has meant that the banks have exaggerated hugely the, uh, the value of their assets as the, their securities holdings values have declined. To compound the error for regulatory purposes when measuring the bank's capital adequacy, that exaggerated and inflated measure of assets also turns into an exaggerated and, in this case, inflated measure of equity value and, therefore, of capital adequacy. So we've been pretending when we know it's not true, and in fact, it's publicly observably not true, that banks are adequately capitalized. We're using book value fiction that's demonstrably false to measure the capital adequacy of banks. It's just downright stupid. And of course, markets are going to react to the reality that they can see, not to the book value fiction that the Fed and the FDIC and the OCC are pretending is true. You would think we would have learned more after the 1980s crises in which it was precisely this mistake of pretending the book values of securities and mortgages were high when we knew they weren't. that caused so much problems in the past. Compounding all of this is the continuation of federal home loan banks as a competing lender of last resort to the Fed. So back in the 1980s, again, after the experience that we had of the Fed propping up 
very weak banks at great cost to the FDIC when those banks finally failed. In FIDC in 1991, we had a law that said the Fed wasn't allowed to lend to undercapitalized banks. But then the federal home loan banks, I guess, aren't affected by that. So contrary to the spirit of FIDCIA, the federal home loan banks continued to lend to these banks. We know with SVB that it lost over $20 billion worth of deposits in 2022, which were replaced by a federal home loan bank loan. Now, if that federal home loan bank hadn't made that loan, those banks would have been under consistent and continuous pressure from the, the retreat of over $20 billion worth of uninsured deposits. They would have been under pressure to adjust their risk management. But not only was the federal funds market missing, but as those uninsured deposits started to leave the banking, the bank, and I'm, I point out, not in a sudden way, not as a run, but as a kind of continuous discipline on the bank, the bank failed to react because it could turn to the federal home loan bank at, for an alternative. That was highly destabilizing. And many people have been pointing out for years that the practice of allowing the federal home loan banks to do this is very systemically destabilizing. Again, I have to say, stupid policy that we knew from the 1980s we needed to correct. And in fact, we tried to correct it, at least partially, with the FIDCIA policies of 1991. Moving to the supervision policy, the third policy framework, failure. Su supervisors are not just allowed, but they're actually charged with the responsibility of monitoring through their examination authority, the health of banks, and intervening to force banks as needed to make themselves stable. So they are not bound by the existence of a capital requirement that says that a bank is healthy. Supervisors can go into a bank and say, you must increase your capital. Your bank is weak. That is why we have supervision, not just capital requirements. The whole point of a supervisory authority, the OCC for national banks, the Fed and uh, the FDIC, depending on which uh, banks they are the primary supervisors of, the whole point of a supervisory authority is to ensure that the banks are being monitored and required to be stable, not just complying with their capital requirements. So, of course, the supervisors needed to intervene when it was demonstrably obvious, based on just the reported, in fact, the 10K reports of banks were showing what their losses, their unrealized losses were on their securities portfolio, they should have intervened. And I want to point out, we've really come a long way in the wrong direction since 1933. The thing that made FDR's policies toward the banking system so successful when he was finally able to take office in 1933 was that he adopted a policy of weak banks would be on closure. They would be shut down until they could demonstrate that they were safe, and then they could go forward. And he had them examined. And for some banks that could qualify, they were they received uh, RFC um, uh, assistance through preferred stock purchases by the RFC. And so the approach that we that was so successful in 1933 to dealing with the banking crisis was weak banks, all banks were, were took a banking holiday. For some banks, they almost immediately reopened if they were demonstrably sound. But for those that were weak, they were either forced to come up with new capital, accept RFC assistance, or be shut down, be liquidated. That was a, a absolutely correct policy because people knew that the banks weren't safe. So by addressing the problem, then once the banks could reopen, they were, re they were able to have public confidence because a process had happened that forced them to recapitalize. Why is the Treasury and the supervisors and the administration not dealing with the problem of demonstrably weak banks by forcing them to recapitalize or be liquidated? I have no idea. This is going on now for months. And it's just a, a, a clear policy failure. But I want to emphasize it's a supervisory policy failure. And I would say also reflects a regulatory policy failure. What do we do about these policy failures? Uh, it's not rocket science. Let's we'll start with monetary policy. Return to a scarce reserves environment. 
where the banks aren't holding massive amounts of excess reserves with an interbank reserves market for loans. And I would recommend a corridor system with a single interest rate that's being managed by the Fed as its monetary target and with the Fed holding only treasury bills as its securities. The move back to a true monetary policy framework with scarce reserves and some kind of hope that the Fed can manage in a, in a transparent way what its intents are, intentions are and with an interbank non-collateralized reserve lending market. Regulatory policy. All securities should be marked to market for regulatory purposes. Furthermore, capital must be marked to market. And the best way to do that is to use a moving average of the market value of equity as a measure of the economic value of a bank's equity. So, for example, JP Morgan, since the financial crisis, has had a market value of equity in excess of its tangible book value of equity, while Citibank has had consistently a market value of equity that's below tangible book value of equity. We've been using tangible book value of equity and other similar kinds of book measures in our regulatory process, including, for example, in stress tests. But that's not really a correct usage. Citibank has been weak beyond what its book value has indicated. So in stress tests, it's considered a success if, for example, Citigroup exits with a sufficient book value of equity. Well, that's wrong. It should be based on the market value of equity, which has been quite stable and quite informative. And many studies have shown it was the market value of equity that would have revealed in 2007 and early 2008 the problems in the banks that were troubled and that required intervention later. We should get back, get to a system in which we take proper account through the marking to market of the securities and also taking into account the equity values in the market, which give a clue when banks have problems in their franchise. Citibank has been operating with a negative intangible value of assets that is a value destroying franchise since 2008. It's been completely unrecognized and not dealt with. Uh, by any, any regulatory rule. So we should move to market value of our securities and using market values of equity to measure compliance with equity ratios. Furthermore, we've learned that all of the hype about Title II of Dodd-Frank was just that, was hype. At the time, people said, no, 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 we're not codifying too big to fail. There is no too big to fail. We're making it easier through Title II not to bail out banks, but to refuse to bail out banks. That was a ludicrous argument at the time, and now it's demonstrably false in two, for, through two facts. First of all, notice that their depositors are going to too big to fail banks in droves. Obviously, they realize that Title II has actually codified too big to failure, uh, too big to fail policies of bailouts for the large banks, not prevented them. And Secondly, the depositors uh, have, have clearly recognized that banks that aren't too big to fail are at a competitive disadvantage. So we need to fix the problem of too big to fail that's now a demonstrated problem uh, from this depositor behavior. You could call it a natural experiment to see whether too big to fail is in existence, and clearly it is. How do we fix that? Well, there were lots of proposals. Um, Dick Herring and I had a proposal, Mark Flannery, a similar proposal, and many others, to use um, high trigger value um, contingent capital claims as a way to incentivize the large banks to maintain capital adequacy. I won't go through that policy uh, proposal again today, but I'll say, obviously, something like that would work very well. Moving on to the other regulatory policy, of course, we should phase out the federal home loan banks. They're a huge source of systemic risk. Let the Federal Reserve be the lender of last resort, and let's not have competition in our lender of last resort. Finally, on supervisory policy, um, when I was chief economist at the OCC, I pushed for using various market-based measures and adding them to the dashboard that supervisors rely on to gauge whether banks are undercapitalized and require supervisory intervention. 
the S-risk model developed at the Stern School of Business would be a great uh, example of that, where it shows the vulnerability of the banks and leads you to push for additional capital. That would all be an obvious tool that we should add. So again, just to summarize, return to a predictable monetary policy framework based on a single measure of monetary policy uh, and open market operations that are based only in treasury bills, restore scarcity in the reserve market, have an interbank uncollateralized uh, Fed funds market, regulatory policy, mark to market, the securities, take account of economic value of equity on the supervisory side, uh, get rid of, uh, I'm sorry, on the federal home loan bank side, get rid of the federal home loan banks as a competing source, require COCOs as another uh, tool to improve the capital adequacy of the banks. And then from a supervisory standpoint, add those same kinds of market-based measures to the dashboard for supervisors to intervene, particularly the S-risk model. Uh, that's all I really have to say. I want to emphasize these are not new proposals. Uh, these proposals and these, this discussion of systematic monetary policy, of the need for scarcity in the reserve market, a corridor system, regulatory policy that's based on economic values, not book value fictions, uh, the, the moral hazard problems of the federal home loan banking system, the need for supervisors to be attentive. It, these are things that are obvious in my mind. And so I come back to, we need to have a, a longer discussion of the political problems that have prevented sensible framework reform in all these dimensions. Thanks for your attention. Again, I apologize. I haven't been able to hear any of you. And um, again, thanks anyway. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, Alex? Thank you, Paul, and thank you for organizing this most interesting discussion. I don't think you can see this. So uh, as Paul has said, last year and early this year, we heard all kinds of nice speeches uh, from both the Treasury and the Fed and others about what good shape the banking system was in. Uh, of course, the shadow banks, so-called, were very much to be feared and had to be regulated more. But the, uh, but the commercial banks were in great shape, and that was thanks to the Dodd-Frank Act and the uh, regulation which had followed it that we could congratulate ourselves uh, for this wonderful shape. Well, since then, needless to say, as we have been discussing, we've had the failure of multiple banks, emergency declarations that these failing banks were systemically important. That is to say that the system of banking was at risk. Uh, we've had bailing out wealthy depositors uh, in the failing uh, banks, those depositors, by the way, who should have taken a haircut uh, on their risky investments that they made. I mean, for the folly of maintaining hundreds of millions in some cases or even billions of dollars in one medium-sized bank, quite an amazing risk management uh, decision on the part of those depositors, but of course they were uh, bailed out, and then it, as, uh, as Paul and Bill have both said, we have the highly interesting uh, situation of the Fed lending very large amounts to the FDIC, well, to the receiverships of the FDIC directly, uh, something we think is unprecedented. Uh, and then all the time with this going on, statements from responsible government officials that the banking system, none, uh, don't worry about these failures and all and these emergency declarations and so on. The banking system is sound and resilient, uh, and you can have confidence into it. But it turns out uh, that not only the failed banks, but many banks across the country had followed the Pied Piper of the Federal Reserve and its lower for longer uh, predictions, uh, statements, and practice to uh, invest long in long-term fixed rate assets and borrow short, thereby creating lots of both interest rate risk and liquidity risk uh, in the banking system. As, as others have said, a classic 
banking risk, a classic banking mistake, and it faces the following problem. That when it comes to deposit runs, it's often said, well, we have these irrational fears. But in fact, runs are highly rational from the viewpoint of the depositor, keeping your money in the questionable bank, which you can't really know what its assets are worth or what's going on in it, uh, has no upside and vast downside. The best you can ever hope for is to get your money back, plus a little interest. The worst you can fear are gigantic losses. So it's highly rational to run. And every banking system has to be structured with the thought that runs are rational from the viewpoint of the depositors. And therefore, we have to uh, uh, expect them in certain circumstances. On top of all this, uh, we find out the banking system has, again, a large exposure uh, to commercial real estate, which is troubled and known to be risky. Once again, I have a quote here, uh, one of my favorites. Quote, uh, the unfavorable conditions in banking were greatly aggravated by the collapse of unwise speculation in real estate. Unquote. That's from the report of the controller of the currency in 1891, and a little has changed uh, since then. Um, now, on interest rate risk, one academic and plausible estimate is that the mark-to-market -market loss of the entire banking system, including both securities and loans, that is to say, your, your, your market value losses on fixed rate loans are every bit as relevant and as important as the, one, as the losses on securities. And if we take both of those into account, according to this study, the banking system has a mark-to-market -market loss of about $2 trillion uh, on its fixed rate securities and loans, $2 trillion. What's the capital of the banking system? Well, it's about $2.2 trillion, but of that $2.2, billion are intangible assets, goodwill and whatnot. So the tangible capital of the banking system is a number like $1.8 trillion, and the mark-to-market loss may be something like $2 trillion. That would suggest to you that you have an entire banking system with, taken on average across the whole system, something approaching zero capital. That, of course, has large variation among the 4,000 and some banks, but that would be the overall situation. Now, uh, what does this mark-to-market loss mean? Uh, may I recommend to you a paper by our excellent chairman, Paul Kupiak, and me, uh, called How Unrealized Losses Turn Into Real Losses. And the way unrealized losses turn into real losses in leveraged financial institutions who have their fixed rate long-term assets funded with short-term floating rate liabilities is the cost of the liabilities goes up and you turn the unrealized loss on the securities into realized cash losses because you're making your old, let's say, 2% return on your fixed rate investments and it's now costing you 5% to carry them. Uh, and, uh, and you're losing a lot of money that way. Now, uh, the big question in the banking system then becomes, how resistant is it to, to the cost of its deposits rising up to market levels, uh, which are 5% or so, short-term interest rates, in order to carry the large amount of fixed rate loans and fixed rate securities on which this $2 trillion or so loss uh, exists. How much is that, that interest cost actually going to rise? In other words, the banking question becomes how much can you continue to cheat the savers in order to prop up the banks uh, as the as the unrealized losses turn into greater interest expense. And that's what we're going to uh, observe here going forward. This contest between the inexorable rise in the funding cost and the, and the hope that you can continue to cheat the savers and keep the deposit cost uh, down. This, this puts the 
banking supervisors who are in favor of bank uh, safety on the side of cheating the savers, of course, as it always has put them on that side uh, historically. Um, now, this puts me in mind of two great quotes from uh, Paul Volcker. Uh, and the first is, as some of you may have heard before, is this, about every 10 years we have the greatest financial crisis in 50 years, said Volcker. He was so right, and we're in it again. Now, I think of the current crisis actually uh, as still the ongoing crisis of 2020. We start off in 2020, the COVID crisis, the financial panic, the sharp economic contraction, the vast expansion of money printing and government expenses, the following bubble markets in everything or the everything bubble, uh, the runaway inflation, the correction with rising interest rates, the deflation of the bubble in the markets of 2022, and now the banking problems of 2023. I think of that as all one uh, uh, big crisis we're still in the aftermath of. Uh, and here we are, well, the last crisis bottomed in 2009, so it's more or less uh, 10 years or about every 10 years, as Paul Volcker said. Now, the other Volcker quote I want to mention is, there are no new problems in banking, only new people. That is to say the new generations get to relive the things that's, that the older ones uh, already did. And this was on Volcker's part, a quite a clever way of talking about the recurrence of banking crises. But here's the question, why do these crises keep recurring when we have such improved regulation? Like say the Dodd-Frank Act and the tens of thousands of implementing, tens of thousands of pages of uh, implementing regulations. Uh, well, this brings me to a quote from the banking and central banking scholar Bernard Schull. Uh, who insightfully wrote in 1993, comprehensive banking reform, traditionally including augmented and improved supervision, has typically evoked a transcendent and in retrospect unwarranted optimism. Uh, in his day, uh, Scholl wrote, Confronting the SNL disaster with yet another comprehensive reform, the Secretary of the Treasury proclaimed two watchwords guided us as we undertook to solve this problem, never again. Well, that was 19, the, the reform of 1989 and then the banking reforms of 1991. Uh, but after that, of course, we got right into in. Uh, something over 10 years later, another massive crisis, as we all know, the crisis happened again. Anyway, in spite of the transcendent optimism about the, uh, about the comprehensive regulatory reform, after the 2007-9 uh, uh, crisis, and of course, the crisis in Europe went on to 2012, uh, but here uh, in 2010, uh, comprehensive reform was once again debated, debated and the political reaction uh, was the Dodd-Frank Act as, as the inevitable follow-on to every financial crisis. Uh, but here we are once again saying, well, now with all this, why, why, didn't, why didn't this work? Um, and it, it seems to me uh, they were up against this fundamental reality of the politics of banking and finance. And um, Charlie mentioned politics, but all, all finance is political. There is no finance that isn't political and politically uh, influenced. Uh, there's probably not much of importance in politics that isn't financial as well. Uh, as we look at this, however, no matter how we organize any government activity, it seems to me, as circumstances change, it will over time have to be reorganized. The perfect answer, unfortunately, does not exist. And whenever we try to engineer and control human behavior, which is what financial regulation is, trying to engineer and control human behavior, uh, those attempts at control themselves induce unexpected adaptations and reactions in markets and also in the behavior of the regulators and politicians 
themselves. Hence, as we observe historically, every reform requires another reform to address the unexpected results of the prior reform, and so on, ad infinitum. Uh, Bernard Scholl is also the author of Scholl's Paradox, and since we're talking about the Fed and its, uh, its role as leader uh, of the financial system into the current interest rate risk uh, problems and liquidity problems, Scholl's Paradox is no matter how many blunders the Fed makes or how big they are, it always becomes more powerful and more prestigious. It seems to me this paradox is true, and we might well be living through uh, another uh, case of it. Now, another way of, of talking about the evolution of, of the last reform and how it turns into the next crisis and the next reform. Um, uh, by the way, may I recommend a great paper by Arnold Kling called Not What They Intended, which is how the how the reforms of the 1990s created the collapse of the 2000s uh, as, as a wonderful example of this. Uh, but, but another way of saying this is when we talk about the banking system, the banking system does not mean the banks only. The banking system is the, co the interacting combination of the banks and the central bank, in our case, the Federal Reserve, and the regulators, the controller of the currency, the deposit insurers, and the politicians, all of that together as one interacting system uh, is the banking system. And we saw this with the Fed's interaction with the banks and their behavior. As the Fed set up and enforced near zero interest rates, near uh, 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 unexpectedly extremely low interest rates, for over 13 years. 13 years is plenty of time for financial actors to build up the expectation that this will continue. Even though you might argue that the longer it goes on, the greater is the probability it's going to reverse in a dramatic way. Markets often act that way. But nonetheless, the, 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 the assumptions uh, get built up, uh, especially when the Fed was not only keeping short-term rates low, but long-term rates low th through its own security purchases and the building of its own quite remarkable up to $8.9 trillion balance sheet. So the Fed was by far the biggest bank in the country at $8.9 trillion. It was also the biggest savings and loan because inside the Federal Reserve, as they were buying not only bonds but mortgage-backed securities, was a mortgage portfolio of $2.6 trillion of long-term fixed rate mortgages funded short, funded with floating rate liabilities, making it far and away the biggest SNL, not only in the country, but in all of history. And now, uh, as the unrealized losses on that portfolio are turning into real losses, through increasing interest expense, the Fed is earning more or less 2% on its mortgages, more or less 2% on its long-term treasuries, uh, which, of course, the mortgages just got a lot longer with the increasing interest rate risk through negative convexity, but the treasuries are also very long. They own a ton of treasuries of more than 10-year remaining maturity, so they're making about 2%. They're financing those at 5%. Well, if your income is 2% and your cost is 5%, uh, it's hard to make money that way uh, for a bank or for the Federal Reserve. So the Fed's own balance sheet, as Paul pointed out, uh, was jammed with gigantic interest rate risk. And so one might not unreasonably ask, how could the Fed criticize banks like Silicon Valley Bank for doing exactly the same thing? that the Fed itself was and is doing. As I say, a question uh, one might, might not unreasonably ask. Now, of course, if you had been confident in the, an interest rate forecast that short-term interest rates would stay low for very long periods of time, that kind of balance sheet 
would have been a good bet. You would have continued to make money. You could have had 2% income and say a half percent interest expense. So let us ask, ask what were the Fed's own interest rate forecasts as it was accumulating this massive interest rate risk in portfolio. Well, I want to look at the uh, Federal Open Market Committee's uh, interest rate forecast for June uh, 2021. Done in June 2021, the forecast for the end of the year 2022. Anybody know what the, what the Open Market Committee's Fed funds forecast for the end of 2022 was in June 21? The median forecast was 25 basis points. Of the members of the members submitting estimates, the highest rate was 0.75%. Well, how about for 2023 at that same meeting? What would what do they think interest rate interest rate uh, uh, interest rates of, of the Fed funds target? would be, be by the end of 2023. The median forecast uh, was 75 basis points. The highest submitted estimate was 1.75%. Well, obviously, had those forecasts been right, the position of Silicon Valley Bank or the banking system as a whole or the Fed itself uh, would still have been profitable. So I, I can't read these forecasts without thinking of that famous, uh, that deservedly famous poem, Casey at the Bat. Uh, and just like Casey, as far as this interest rate forecasting goes, the mighty Fed struck out. Uh, and the result is uh, that its aggregate operating losses, uh, the Federal Reserve itself, since last September are, are $54 uh, billion. Dollars. Now, even more fundamental than this, because we're talking here about the fundamental causes for the banking uh, system, and, and I think even more than this is, the, is this underlying unresolved conflict. And it is this, that people all over the world, in this country and all over the world, long and want their bank deposits to be risk-free. And governments want to make these deposits risk-free. And they attempt to satisfy this longing for risk-free deposit insurance by creating uh, deposit insurance schemes and intensive regulation and for bailing out depositors uh, of failed uh, banks and for striving constantly to promote confidence in the banking system. We're still seeing that now with announcements that the banks are strong uh, and uh, resilient. Um, but the fundamental problem is that these deposits are financing businesses which are fundamentally highly risky. How do you take a fun the fundamentally risky business of lending money and hoping you're going to get it back uh, I learned long ago this saying from an old banker, lending money is the only business in the world that when you have made the sale, you give the customer the money, hoping to get it back. So we have a fundamentally risky business, and we're trying to finance it with risk-less liabilities. You know it can't, it can't really work over time. It's a, it's a fundamental, deep conflict inside the politics of banking uh, and, uh, and banking systems. Um, so uh, we get, every 10 years or so, a, a great crisis. And then we get four strategies from the government to cope with them. I'll just tell you briefly. The first is uh, the, the, uh, the first is saying everything is okay and trying to maintain the confidence. When it's clear that's not true, the second is to mandate delay in recognizing losses. That always happens. The third strategy is expanding credit from the central bank and the government. 
but no matter how much credit you extend, if you're broke, you're still broke, no matter how much more you can borrow. And so the last is moving to making equity investments in banks. Charlie mentioned the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Uh, and of course, we had TARP. And we go through this because we're facing this underlying, underlying conflict. Can we solve this underlying conflict? Uh, I've always been uh, intrigued by the old idea that you can solve it if you're willing to separate money from credit and to create some deposits which are actually money, which are actually backed or collateralized by extremely low risk assets and other deposits which are not money, they're only credit and they're fully at risk. Could you really do it? Well, maybe, would it work? Maybe, it might be worth a try. Uh, we'll see as our banking evolution uh, goes on. But I think for sure we're headed to debates about how we can ensure that banking problems never happen again, uh, but that at the deepest level, these debates and the problems we're experiencing uh, reflect this deep underlying problem of trying to create a risk-free financing for what is in fact a risky business. And I will end with this story. When I was younger and I was a senior vice president, of a bank, I used to give talks to the trainees and I would say this, it was true in those days. You will have noticed that around here we all wear dark suits and white shirts and conservative ties and we exist in wood paneled offices of magnificent buildings with pillars and marble. Why is that? Of course, they had no answer. So I would tell them the answer is because what we're actually doing is so risky, we have to look conservative. I just want to remind you of, of the last thing after credit expansion was John Paul Juncker's oh, yes. statement. When it really gets bad, you have to lie. That's right. <laughs> That's true. I forgot that one. <laughs> Andy. Charlie, can you hear us now? Charlie, if you can hear us, can you give us a thumbs up? He did. He, I guess he can't. Well, he's not, he, he gave us, he's not a good What's that? While you were walking by, he nodded. Oh, he up. did. All right. Charlie, can you give me a thumbs up? Oh, I right. Hear you. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Um, so these are all heroes of mine. Um, I'm really um, proud to actually be, uh, thanks to Paul and to AI for inviting me to participate in this panel. So let me just be clear from the beginning, I'm not a banking expert, okay? I never, unlike Bill Nelson, my colleague from the Fed, I never worked in the bank supervision or oversight. Um, what, am I, what do I know about, okay? Well, I'm, I know something about monetary policy strategy and frameworks, and so I'll just endorse what Charlie said a few minutes ago, and I think Bill said it in his, in his opening remarks, that, that a major problem we've been facing now is, um, is is a, is a really poorly designed monetary policy framework. Um, and it's unfortunate because the Federal Reserve um, in 2018-19 and into 2020 was trying to come up with a way to improve its monetary policy framework. And I think in retrospect, it's clear that it was a complete fiasco and failure. And I think we need to ask you know, some hard questions going forward, what went wrong with that? Um, they called it the Fed listens, but I think in retrospect, it was kind of clear that they were just listening to themselves. Um, we need a systematic monetary policy framework, and again, I think the things that Bill and Charlie emphasized, you know, underscore this. Um, you can't just talk about the baseline outlook. You have to, to, to the central bank has to, is there a problem with the, can you turn down the volume? There's a little bit of echo here. You're okay. We can All right, it sounds like an echo to me. Um, the, the, the central bank needs to identify material risks and explain its contingency plans. Now, some Fed officials could say, well, who could have ever imagined? But the truth is that in June 2020, Mickey Levy and Michael Bordo, who many of you know, Michael's another hero of mine, um, um, the two of them and I wrote a paper. We, it's an NPR working paper. You can check June 2020. We identified three scenarios for the crisis. And one of them was a severe average scenario where we were going to have a long, slow recovery. But another one, the benign scenario, was one where vaccines were going to be developed quickly and disseminated quickly. 
uh, that the, mar the, the labor market would reopen quickly. Um, and it turned out that by early 2021, there was a, a, an unprecedented fiscal stimulus. And so in that benign scenario, I think it would have been completely reasonable for the Federal Reserve, if not in 2020, at least in early 2021, to be, unlike the, the ones that Alex just highlighted, we were watching those at the time, right? That not just a baseline forecast of, oh, interest rates are gonna remain close to zero for the next several years, right? That the, the Federal Reserve should have identified a risk scenario in early 2021 um, that, as Bill said, right? I gotta have the right definition of what's a neutral rate. And we understand from basic macroeconomics, Monetary Policy 101, um, that if inflation's above your target persistently, you're gonna have to raise rates above neutral. That means that actually in January 2021, it would have been very reasonable for the Federal Reserve in its quarterly projections to have had a scenario where the federal funds rate goes up to 5% by the end of 2022 or into 2023, which is of course what happened. And all I'm trying to say here is that was not unthinkable at the time. And it would have helped a lot if the Federal Reserve had been doing that. And it wasn't unthinkable for the Federal Reserve to be doing scenario analysis and contingency planning and to explain it to the public and to the markets. And that would have freed up probably the supervisors <laughs> to be you know, flagging those issues with banks like SVB and First Republic and others. So th this is a major problem in the monetary policy framework. It needs to be fixed. And I think that this is gonna fall in the laps of the Congress, and probably not this year. We know Congress got its hands full this year, but probably in a couple of years, okay? And there's some of you in this room who can help influence that, okay? We were not so far from it, I'll say, um, call it eight years ago, okay? There was a movement in Congress to say, we need the Federal Reserve to become more systematic and more transparent, more rules-based. And people like Charlie Calamiris and Mike Bordo and others, long list, Charlie Plosser, um, were really supportive of that and it just didn't make it through. Why? Because the Federal Reserve said, oh, we don't need that. <laughs> just leave it to us, we'll, we'll figure it out, we'll manage it. Well, now the taxpayers are being handed not just the trillion dollar bill from the Federal Reserve, but it sounds like from what um, Alex and Charlie have described, it could be two or three trillion dollar bill if in fact, um, in order to, to make sure that ordinary depositors um, don't lose everything in their bank accounts, that um, the US government, like what happens with SNL, um, you know, has to recapitalize the whole banking system. It could be very, very expensive. Okay, so the title of my talk, which I'll try to keep brief, because I promised Paul that we'll have plenty of time for, for discussion, um, but the slides will be posted. I, I just um, uh, gave them before, just before the session, so they will be posted. The title of my slides are Audit the Fed. Audit the Fed. So let's spend, say, five, six, eight minutes and talk about this, okay? Um, one problem with that phrase, Audit the Fed, is that it's sometimes been used by people who maybe really wish the Fed would just disappear and go away. Okay, I don't happen to share that view. I, I'm guessing, Bill, you, you would agree with me that we actually probably need a central bank, I think. Is that a fair statement? Um, maybe everyone else is nodding. Charlie, what do you think? Do we need a central bank? Can you just nod? Okay, all right, so there are people who say, well, the right solution to all this is to make it completely free markets and there's no central bank and there's no regulation whatsoever. That's actually not my view. So when I say audit the Fed, I don't really mean abolish the Fed. I really mean audit the Fed. Okay, so what's an audit? Well, in the very most narrow use of the term, and you can look on Wikipedia, it's got a really nice <laughs> article about audits. Okay, the most narrow one is called an accounting audit. And all you do, you have an external firm that comes in, they just look at the books, and they do a few spot tests, and they write a report, it's usually a one-page cover letter, <laughs> to say, we've examined the books, and as far as we can tell, they're materially accurate. And that's it, okay? But that is not the only definition of audit. In fact, if you look at the Wikipedia, there's much, the conventional use of the term audit is much broader than that. What's called a performance audit 
means that you have an external firm that's coming in and looking at the management structure. They're looking at the operations, okay? They're looking at everything the firm does or the organization, okay? And trying to look at the efficiency and effectiveness of the organization. A comprehensive audit actually includes both. A comprehensive audit is both the accounting audit, kind of materially accurate, there's no fraud, okay, but also the performance audit, that things are effective and efficient. Okay, so now we have to go back in history a little bit. After World War II, there was an immense growth in the size of the federal government, and by the 70s it became clear, I'm old enough to remember this, okay, people like William Proxmire, um, complaining about the Pentagon buying $2,000 hammers. And the, the public was outraged. And of course, it was connected a little bit to Watergate and other things, but um, there was a general recognition that things were getting too complex for Congress to be able to oversee, to oversee each of these federal agencies. So what did Congress do? And it was pretty nonpartisan in my uh, understanding and my recollection. Nonpartisan. They did several things. One was they created the Government Accountability Office, and they gave it pretty comprehensive authority to do a pretty comprehensive audit of every federal agency. And there were only a couple exceptions. One of them is, as I understand it at least, there are certain aspects of the CIA that the GAO cannot audit. And we think, all right, well, that's probably reasonable because maybe it's just too sensitive. There's a, there's a spy somewhere whose life might be at risk if any of that information, right? So there's, there's certain types of military intelligence that are actually exempt from jail review, and I think that's probably reasonable, okay? Um, but the other major exemption in the 1970s was the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve said, oh, we don't need that. And they were able to actually persuade the congressional committees to exempt the Federal Reserve from comprehensive GAO reviews. Why? Why? Why were they exempted? And the answer is because the Federal Reserve was simple. Okay, this goes back to things that Bill and Alex, and I think um, even you maybe started at the beginning, Paul. Okay. In, in the 1970s, the Federal Reserve had almost no interest-bearing liabilities. The liability side of its balance sheet was paper cash that doesn't pay interest, and it was bank reserves, okay, that at that time didn't pay interest. Okay, and the asset side of its balance sheet was super simple. It was mostly treasury bills and some treasury notes and a few treasury bonds, but really simple. And so the Federal Reserve succeeded in persuading Congress, leave us out of this. We don't have any $2,000 hammers. We're, we're a small, simple organization. We have a really simple balance sheet. We have no interest-bearing liabilities, at least most of the time. There were occasionally reverse rebels, but, but very little. And Congress said, okay, that's fine. And so in the GAO Act in the 1970s, the Federal Reserve was exempt. Now let me just ask you, does that still make sense today? If the GAO was being established today, could the Federal Reserve reasonably go to Congress and say, oh, we're so simple, we don't need them? I mean, you already heard it for the last hour and 34 minutes. Okay, it's just obvious. It's totally obvious to me. It's a no-brainer that Congress should give the GAO comprehensive authority to do comprehensive reviews of everything the Federal Reserve does. Now, you might have a couple questions about this. Okay, I think one reasonable question is, um, well, gee, the GAO really, you know, does it really do any good? Maybe that's just, you know, a bunch of paperwork, paper shuffling. And the answer to that is no. The GAO is not perfect, but it's pretty remarkable. Can anyone here guess how much the GAO has saved the taxpayers over the last five years? Someone want to take a guess? I'm serious. Some, anyone on the panel? Anyone know? Because the GAO, they've got it on their website. They, they, they were, they're very transparent about all this. Every recommendation they make to every federal agency is posted on their website with an indication of whether the agency followed it or not. They can document that 80% of their recommendations have been implemented. 
And for every single one of those, they can calculate what was the savings to taxpayers. And so my answer is $550 billion over the last five years. 80% of the recommendations were implemented, and they saved taxpayers $550 billion. Now, what that tells me is that it's going to take time. If you say, if the Congress were to say to GEO, we want you to start to be a real watchdog for the Federal Reserve. The same as you are for the Pentagon, the same as you are for the Interior Department, the same for the State Department, all these other agencies, the GAO monitors, okay? GAO would have to build up expertise. They probably, because the Fed itself is so complex, okay? It would probably take two or three or four years. They'd have to have a contract with Bill and Charlie, and maybe Paul and Alex would help too, to kind of figure out, well, who are the experts we need? <laughs> How are we gonna organize this, okay? I mean, it would take some time, but if that had happened in 2012 or even in Dodd-Frank, and there was a move at the time, and the Fed squelched it, okay, but, but if, the, if the GAO had been given comprehensive authority, I think the, the GAO might have actually been looking pretty hard at some of these things that have gone wrong over the last few years. Maybe they wouldn't have caught it all, but if they even caught half of it, it might have saved taxpayers a trillion dollars. And you think about it, like 50, 70, 80 staff members at GAO is pretty cheap. They're not, their salaries aren't that high, <laughs> okay? The GAO can show that it's like returns of 500 or 1,000 to one of the money that goes into the GAO to pay for their staff and their, their reviews and the, and the external consultants they hire compared to the return to the taxpayer. It's a no-brainer. Okay, the other question you might say, and certainly Fed officials have said this, is, oh, well, that could interfere with our independence. <laughs> and you know that Federal Reserve independence is sacred. <laughs> it's, 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 like it's untouchable, okay? So I would ask the question, is there a way to give the GAO authority to do comprehensive reviews of the Federal Reserve that wouldn't open the door to political interference? Because I think we, we don't really want the, to open the door to political interference with the Federal Reserve's monetary policy decisions. We've seen that book before. We don't want it, we don't want it to happen again. And I think the right answer to this is the GAO review should be regular. Probably every year would be a perfectly reasonable solution to this. What that means is that if a congressman is concerned about something the Fed's doing, congressman can write a letter to the head of the GAO say, we are really concerned about this, we'd like to look at And the GAO's answer is, oh, of course we look at all those things and we'll be sure to look at that again in our next annual review. Okay, but no individual congressman or senator would have any particular ability to influence what the GAO does. The GAO is the watchdog. They should be given comprehensive authority to review the Federal Reserve. Okay, now there was another thing that happened in the 70s. The, the, the Congress created the Inspector General's offices. And for all the major federal agencies, Treasury, State, Pentagon, Interior, the Inspector General is an independent federal official who is accountable directly to the Congress. They're appointed by the President of the United States, confirmed by the Senate, like a federal judge. And if you say, well, are the IGs perfect? I'd say, no, they're not perfect, <laughs> okay? Nothing's perfect in this world, okay? But it was important to Congress to establish the IGs because they recognize things are complex at all these agencies. They just can't figure it out on their own. The poor congressional staffers, you know, totally overwhelmed with work. Um, they need an IG to help identify the issues. The IG is supposed to be doing comprehensive audits. Comprehensive audit, not just financial audit, comprehensive audit. Who was exempted in the 1970s from having a fully independent IG? Well, the answer is there's some minor federal offices you've never heard of that have 10 employees. And for those minor offices, Congress said, okay, we don't want to create a lot of new bureaucracy. If the agency is really that small and simple, then they can have an IG who is a member of their own staff, who is an employee of that agency. Okay, and we'll let it go. Okay, we're really concerned about making sure that there's an independent IG for all the major agencies, the small ones, we'll let it go. Well, guess what? Federal Reserve says, oh, well, we don't need an independent IG. <laughs> okay, we don't need one. We're so simple. 
And Congress said, okay, we'll classify you with those other little offices and agencies. You can have an, you can have an IG who uh, is an employee of the Federal Reserve. Now, if this was happening today, do you think Congress would accept that argument? Again, it's a no-brainer. The Fed's really complicated. They need a fully independent IG, appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate, serves for a 10-year term, um, approved on a, on a bipartisan basis. Um, and sometimes Congress struggles, as they do with federal judges and whatever, you know, with appointments. Okay, there can be a vacancy. That's okay. It's not the end of the world. Then the deputy IG serves for a while. This should happen. And again, it may not happen this year, although actually Rick Scott from Florida and Elizabeth Warren from Massachusetts have um, written a bill together, um, what I will call it a nonpartisan bill. Um, the Fed is saying, oh no, we don't need that. And so will that bill make it through Congress this year? I don't know, but it should. And there's some of you in this room and maybe some people online um, I, I hope in our discussion here we can talk more about some of this, okay, because there's deep governance issues here. Congress is the boss. In the U.S. Constitution, it, Congress is responsible for regulating the money supply. Congress has delegated that responsibility to the Fed, but Congress cannot abdicate that responsibility. Congress has to oversee the Federal Reserve. And so these mechanisms like IG and GAO are the obvious no-brainer mechanisms to strengthen congressional oversight of the Fed. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thanks. Uh, th and thank you all for some uh, really, uh, really great um, talks here and really bringing up a lot of good points. Um, I'm going to throw out a few questions. Um, I'm going to start with, and then I'm going to go to the audience. Um, I'm going to start with ones that nobody talked about. So people say, uh, you read online, you know, this run, the run rate was unprecedented at these banks, and it was because, because of the Internet and banking apps, and everybody was high-tech and connected, and this is the new world. And, you know, it, it, brought, it brings out three questions. Uh, there, people say, well, the deposit insurance limit must be, must be raised because, because otherwise we have these runs. Then it, and, and I don't know how you feel about that. Um, uh, and secondly, what does this mean about Fed Now? When, when Fed Now is going to come online and you can move your money interday, everybody can move their money interday. And what, what does it mean for a central bank digital currency? Uh, we have this new problem of, of contagious bank runs, and, the, and, and, and there are still folks who think a central bank digital currency is the way to go. I mean, it, aren't, these prob, aren't these kind of all huge problems, we didn't, we didn't bring them about, Char Charlie. <laughs> Charlie, you're up. No, thank you, I just, I, I didn't mean to be press, I just did want, wanted to make sure you saw me raising my hand. So I wanna um, emphasize something I think is re very rarely said, which is, first, uh, the runs were not sudden. Actually, as I pointed out, Deposits started leaving Silicon Valley Bank quite many months ago, and it was the Federal Home Loan Bank's loan that replaced those lost deposits that prevented the, them from having to deal with this at an early point. Even in spite of that undermining of the market discipline through the Federal Home Loan Bank loan, I want to make the argument that we actually are much better off then if, we, if all the banks, uh, including Silicon Valley Bank, had had 100% deposit insurance, here's why. Remember the savings and loan crisis of the 1980s. The problem was they had typically 100% deposit insurance, and so they operated as zombies for a decade. And once your bank loses its equity, you start taking risk because it's a one-sided game. And that's when the cost of the taxpayers get hugely magnified. So actually, in spite of the apparent disorder that this is all causing, it's actually a wake-up call that's forcing the banks one way or another and uh, the regulators one way or another to deal with a problem rather than ignore it. That's a huge benefit of not having 100% deposit insurance that we're currently enjoying. I also want to point out that extending deposit insurance 
Uh, I just have a paper published this past year in, in the Journal of Financial Intermediation. But there's nothing really new about that paper. The entire literature, academic literature, is one-sided. The deposit insurance increases in generosity cause greater systemic risk in the banking system. The, the justification for deposit insurance was to reduce systemic risk. We now know that it does the opposite. There is no uh, disagreement in the academic literature. Uh, we can fix this problem by fixing the regulation of banks to restore market discipline, to restore regulatory discipline, we don't have to go down the path of making the banking system permanently riskier with more deposit insurance. And I want to emphasize, we should be recognizing that we're getting a benefit from the lack of 100% deposit insurance right now, despite the apparent chaos. Thanks. Thank you, Charlie. Um, also, if you want to pick up on Charlie's point, but Fed now and central bank digital currency, I think these are on the table. Bill, do you want to weigh in? Uh, sure. So uh, first, I'd point out that there is already a, a real-time payment system between banks operating the real-time payment uh, system that, that a large part of the banking system has already signed up for. Uh, and FedNow is an interbank system. So it really isn't, it's, you know, individuals are not going to be op <coughs> in communicating with their banks through FedNow. Uh, so, you know, you can, you can still pick up your app and, and request that your funds be removed from the bank using your app now. Uh, and, and that would also be true, especially if the banks were connected to each other with RTP. Uh, but, I, but I do think that there would be substantial risk. I think the situation would be m much worse if there was a central bank digital currency because the central bank digital currency is a manner, is, is a, you know, as all of the people weighing the pros and cons of central bank digital currencies point out, it's just a magnet for a flight to quality. If you can immediately digitally move your, your investment in a bank to a liability of the Federal Reserve System, it would have just amplified the movements by that much more. And, and the discussions of you know, how one could control that risk are really very ill-formed, right? So one, one way would be, well, you put a limit on how much people can hold. There's a couple of observations I'd make on that. First of all, if you have a limit, then people can tell how much you have, and that's a, that's a real problem. It conflicts with, with transparency, uh, and, uh, or privacy, rather. So you have to look, hook it up to another bank. Well, that raises a question of, well, how, isn't this supposed to be some way to bring in people that don't have banks? There's all kinds of problems with this. Uh, and more, moreover, I, you know, these are, in terms of limits, and you can see it in the Fed's overnight RRP facility. It's a very similar problem. When they designed the facility and opened the facility in 2013 and 2014, by the way, this is a facility where money funds and GSEs are able to make overnight investments in the Federal Reserve, very much like a bank does when they, when they hold reserve balances. But the Fed opened it before liftoff in 2013 to try to support the increases. Well, a lot of people on the committee, including people like Governor Powell and Jeremy Stein and Dan Trullo, were concerned that this new facility would support flights to quality and cause a problem. So part of the way that that was managed was they put in limits and limits on the amount per counterparty, limits on the total amounts. Well, of course, what happened is as soon as any of those limits were approached, the limits were raised. They were always raised because for it to serve its purpose, the limits couldn't be binding. And I'm sure that that's what would happen with the central bank digital currency as well. I will. Andy? Oh, um, yeah, so um, as far as I'm concerned, everything that could have possibly gone wrong with these concerns about a central bank digital currency will go wrong with the reverse repo facility. Okay, we've already got it. It's already unlimited and cap, okay, with a wide range of counterparties. Okay, it's already expanded from a few hundred billion dollars. Now it's up close to two and a half trillion. Okay, so here's the scenario. I think well, let's try to think this through. Okay, let's try in advance. So we no one says later, oh well, who could have imagined? Okay, so here's a scenario. Okay, in the next few months or a year, okay, some more banks start having problems for the reasons that Alex and Charlie identified. And everyone starts to realize, and when I say everyone, I don't mean the little mom and pops, okay, I mean the, everyone who has money, okay, um, starts to realize that the whole bank system is going to probably go down, okay, at least they're worried about it. 
Okay, and so they move their money into money market funds where that's all deposited at the Fed in the reverse repo facility. And the reverse repo facility will go from two and a half trillion to three, to three and a half, to four. And as that flight to quality starts happening, everyone see that this will be a run. And then we will look back and we'll say, well, when the Federal Reserve was expanding and creating the unlimited reverse repo facility in 2021 to 2022, was there any discussion of the extent to which this could actually facilitate a major bank run of the 21st century? And we look at the FOMC minutes and there's just nothing there, which comes back again to why I think we have to have a JO and an independent, fully independent IG, because of an, an independent comprehensive JO review of the stinging reverse repo facility and a fully independent IG who was took, taking a hard look at it would have actually looked at this in 2013 when they started cracking open the door and again in 2017 and again in 2019 and again in 2020 and warning Congress to say, uh-oh. And Congress has gotten a lot of warnings about the central bank digital currency. I think there's actually a lot of members of Congress who understand some of the concerns that you all have expressed. How many members of Congress understand this reverse repo facility is an accident waiting to happen? And now no one can say, oh, well, who could have imagined it? Because I'm on the record here today, and I've actually <laughs> talked to reporters in the media. Okay, there's a very nice article in the Financial Times just a few weeks ago where that reporter discussed this. It's, it's extremely dangerous. It's like, a, it's like, a, it's like if we imagine a, a truck outside of this building that was filled with toxic waste, and then we found out that the, the metal of that truck was 80 years old, and we all started realizing that that thing could burst open at any moment, we probably wouldn't be sitting here anymore. We would get the heck out and we'd be calling our siblings saying, leave, <laughs> what's next door, the Carney Endowment? Like we'd call them, like get out of here, the, the truck might blow. That would, that would be a rational run. <laughs> the Brookings audience would run. AEI people would, <laughs> stay, would stay for this. Well, I'm mean, just saying these are rational runs. The whole point here is, and so it's, it's true that the social media and, 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 the, and the internet and all these things make these runs able to happen faster. I, I'm not sure that the run uh, with the internet is any faster than the local bank in a small town in 1931. The lines with, the with the lines out the door, and it, not a lot faster than Continental Illinois in 1984, when it was the, the run was in the international markets, it was all done by wire in, in, in well, wholesale runs, money markets, the, taking their money the, out. The runs, the runs can be bigger in the case of these three banks, because, you know, 90 plus percent of the accounts were over $250,000, and some of them were many, many millions of As dollars. was true in Continental <laughs> Illinois. Uh, these were, you were there? These were, I was there. Yeah. Uh, but I want to say that in, eight, in, uh, in support of what Charlie said, in 1802, Henry Thornton, in an inquiry into the paper credit of Great Britain, pointed out, I think, maybe not for the first time, but anyway, he did point it out in 1802, that if the Bank of England rushed in and the government rushed in every time to prop up the banks, the banks would become riskier and they would, they would take on and persist in the, uh, in the credit mistakes because in credit mistakes are inevitable. Uh, and that's, uh, that was again debated in the time of, of Walter Badgett, of whether it was indeed a good idea to, to rush in and bail out the banks? And wouldn't it just encourage more mistakes? And it certainly was true, as Charlie said in the 80s, that many bankrupt uh, uh, savings and loans were kept in business and kept functioning and kept making bad deals because their depositors weren't worried. Uh, and, and Freddie right. St. Germain had raised the deposit insurance limit to $100,000. And all the, the depositors were, were happy, and so the money stayed in and, and could be lost. And this is, uh, if I may say it again, this, in, in my mind, this fundamental distinction oh. between a money function, which you want to be extremely low risk, and a credit function, which is unavoidably risky. Okay. And, and, and back then, too, there was only one examiner in the whole district 
of Texas looking at all the because <laughs> all the rest left when they moved the Well, uh, and remember the with the Texas banks in the 80s, nine of the biggest nine banks in Texas all failed in the 1980s, yeah. not only big. SNLs. Okay, I want to get to, to a couple other things. Charlie, um, we're all geese, and Charlie wants to go back to the good old days back when we had a federal funds market and... <laughs> And it really worked, and I'm I'm with them there. But the wait a minute, and and I want to go back to the good old days when the Fed owned zero mortgages. Okay, all right. We're, so we're 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 going back to the future. But Charlie, if we're going to go back to the future, this is going to be a real problem because the Fed's going to have to sell its portfolio, and it's got a trillion dollars of unrecognized losses on its books. How are we going to actually do that? How's the Fed going to shrink its balance sheet, and we're going to get back to? To reserves that are, you know, uh, you know, people people bid for them because they need them. How are we going to come back to rare rare reserves? I think there are two parts to the answer to your, you know, very good question, very difficult question. One is an accounting aspect, and the other is a, a real policy question. So I would first start by saying, the accounting rules the Fed uses, uh, again, and I completely support Andy's proposal. But one of the things that we need to change is that the Fed is using its own accounting rules. Yes. That no one determines the accounting rules the Fed uses other than the Fed. And so saying that the, the, the Fed, we would have a loss if we recognized a loss is not true. We already have the loss. The Fed has already experienced the loss. So let's first change the accounting so that we don't have this, this fiction of unrecognized law. So that's an accounting change. And once you do that, you realize, well, it really doesn't matter whether we recognize it or not because it's already happened. But now the policy part of the answer, that's a little trickier. How quickly can the Fed go back to the, poli to the stance that I think most of us, if not all of us, would like, which is a Treasury bills only holding policy. Um, and here is my view on that. Um, on the mortgage-backed securities, that's a little bit tougher because that that's not something that the Treasury can fix directly in an easy way. But let's recognize that in terms of the maturities of securities that issued by the Treasury, as opposed to the maturities held by the public, the Fed is, is making an intervening decision distinguishing and dif making different the maturities issued by the Treasury and the maturities held by the public. That's the Fed's current inappropriate policy. The Treasury, through its debt management policies, has traditionally been charged with determining the maturities held by the public. Why? Because by determining the maturities it issues, and if the Fed stays to a predictable Treasury bills only policy, then effectively it's the debt management decisions of the Treasury that determine the maturity structure of the Treasury debt held by the public. So how can we fix this quickly? Well, if, if anyone made the mistake of electing me president of the United States, what I would do is orchestrate a debt swap between the Treasury and the Fed. And that could be neutralized in terms of its effect on maturities held by the public simply through debt Treasury through debt management policies by the Treasury. So there really isn't a problem here. We could pretty quickly, on a sort of mark-to-market -market basis, exchange debt so that the Fed could quickly revert to having only Treasury bills on its balance sheet simply through a debt management uh, policy by the, by the Treasury. Now, in other words, what I'm saying is we wouldn't really need to have any immediate effect on uh, debts held by the public, we could have that effect evolving over time so that we don't have to have a very sudden change. But it, it seems to me that we can, the Treasury and the Fed can engage in a swap agreement that immediately restores the Fed to an appropriate uh, balance sheet structure. And uh, the mortgage-backed security piece of that is a little more tricky because that's not something that can be done through a debt a swap of the Fed and the Treasury. But I think that uh, we can do this reasonably quickly, let's say over five years, I would imagine the mortgage-backed security problem could also be addressed. So I, I agree with you, there are some transition issues, but I think 
what we really need is first a guiding light of an administration with a commitment to something that makes sense long run, and then we can all weigh in on what's the right transition path. So, uh, you know, all of us old old central bankers, uh, our our view of sort of what how the money markets behave, the relationship between reserves and the federal funds rate is informed by this model that was developed back when they weren't paying interest on reserves, and it was really developed by the behavior of the federal funds rate within the day. And the idea was that, that there was a demand function for reserves that was flat at the discount rate, then had a steep part going down, and then was flat at basically zero. And that's because within the day, if the Fed left extra reserves out there, they would observe that interest rates would fall to zero pretty quickly. There, that was subject to reserve averaging, which had an effect. But, um, that view has finally been basically rejected. I think that the new, there's a new consensus building among central bankers. The fact is that when the Fed pays interest on reserves and when central bank, banks pay interest on reserves, if they provide reserves, banks adjust their business practices to make use of those reserves. Moreover, examiners get used to the banks having all those reserves and they, and they build in an expectation that those reserves will be there. As a consequence, that steep part of the demand curve moves out. And you, and you can see it in the Fed's own pre, uh, explanations of what, where was the demand curve steep. Back before they started paying interest on reserve, the answer was $35 billion, about $35 billion. Now, as soon as they started paying interest on reserves and it's QE, that number just started growing. And I don't have the table in front of me, but it was $100 billion, then it was $500 billion, then it was $600 billion. And the, the New York Fed just released their projection of the Federal Reserve balance sheet. And the current number that they estimate is $2.6 trillion. Now that was before the banking problems that happened, which surely caused everybody to reassess upward the amount of reserve balances that they hold. So the, so the, so the structural demand for reserves right now isn't, isn't probably something above $2.6 trillion. Now there's only $3.2 trillion out there. And when the lending for the crisis goes down, it's gonna be about $3 trillion. And it's being drained by sales by about $80 billion a month. So now it all has to do with the behavior of the overnight RP facility and whether that goes down, and I won't even get into that. But, but the point is that we could be looking at reserve scarcity relatively soon. But that number is not immutable. That is a number that we now realize can be moved up and can be moved down. So, what, so the Fed isn't going to need to sell any securities. It's gonna relatively soon get to that point, as we observed in September 2019, where are the mark, financial market conditions to get tight again? And the trick is, at that point, they need to be able to conduct policy to then manage that demand for reserves back down. And they'll need to remember what they forgot in September 2019, is that when you approach that steep part of the demand curve, you have to control, through open market operations, the supply of reserve balances that are out there again. But what they can do, once they get to that point, and they can engineer money market rates, the federal funds rate, repo rates, being significantly or at least materially above the rate that they pay on deposits, banks will begin to economize on their holdings of deposits. And you saw that in 2018 when JP Morgan made a big switch out of reserve balances and into repo because repo rates were higher. Once you get to that point and when you keep rates above, then you will gradually move that level back down. Uh, moreover, the, you could do what the Bank of England did. Now, the, the Fed's plan is pretty, at this point, is a little crazy, and I'll have to go into that. So their plan is, we want to get, we don't know where that steep part is, and we're approaching it from above, but we want to stop about $300 billion before we get there. So that's a pretty hard plan to execute. What the Bank of England is doing is they're saying, we're going to go down until we see borrowing start to pick up. Now the advantage of that is not only will money market rates be higher than the deposit rate, but you'll start to get increasing frequency of institutions being willing to use the discount window, which will help with all of many of the problems that I described in my remarks. But moreover, you'll then be able to shrink the Fed, shrink that demand for reserve balances. You're not gonna get it back down to $35 billion. It's a, it's a different world now. But you're gonna be able to get it much, much smaller than it is now. I don't know where it will be, but that's the way to, to get it down. And you won't need any asset sales to do that because it will be a gradual process. Okay. So can, I, can I add one more thing? Of course. Just to add even more complications into the world. Okay. 
So a problem here, which became apparent in 2008, I was actually there in Monte Ferris at the time, was that, um, so the Federal Reserve Board set the discount rate. Um, and so when Congress gave the Federal Reserve Authority to start paying interest on reserves, for probably historical reasons, they said, oh, well, then the Federal Reserve Board of Governors will also set the interest on reserve rate. Okay, and at the time it seemed immaterial because the reserves were small and the interest on reserves was gonna be a few hundred million dollars and it just wasn't really an issue. But, but in 2008, um, the Fed started actively adjusting interest on reserves along with these other policies. There became a tension. The FMC sets the federal funds target and the FMC is responsible for the open market operations that affect the repo rate. Um, and the Federal Reserve Board is setting the interest on reserve rate. And so then there was a question about, well, in effect, the Federal Reserve Board could just disband the FOMC, because the Federal Reserve Board could set the interest on reserve rate and the discount rate in a way that would make the, those two administrative rates would take over and, and the FOMC would become irrelevant. And Ben Bernanke, Give him some credit. I think he made the right decision. He said, no, the FMC is important. It's important to have the regional Federal Reserve Banks really involved in this. It's an important part of the Federal Reserve's governance. So we're going to do it the other way. The FMC will continue to decide on the federal funds rate target. Um, and then the Federal Reserve Board will just um, ratify that by making the corresponding changes to the discount rate and the, and the interest on reserve rate. And it's gone that way ever since. Um, part of the problem here, I think, I think, is that the, there's too much power in the Federal Reserve Board in D.C. and not enough power dispersed among the regional feds. Pat Toomey, before he retired last year, he actually proposed a bill, I think it was a great bill, maybe it can be fine-tuned, okay, but his bill said, all of the 12 regional Federal Reserve Bank presidents should be like federal judges, okay? They should be public officials. They should be appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate, advised and consent, okay? And every Federal Reserve Bank president should vote on every Federal Reserve decision. And that would have included, you know, the regulatory decisions. It would include the interest on reserve rate, the discount rate. You just have one governing body of the Federal Reserve and simplify the governance and simplify the accountability and frankly reduce the power of the Fed chair and disperse that power to a group of experts. I think Senator Toomey's bill is absolutely right. Of course, it's not gonna go through this year, but it's another potentially significant improvement in the Fed's governance that shouldn't be forgotten. And maybe in 2025, maybe it has to wait till 2028, who knows, but um, I guess you were talking about a, a wise leadership that we want these things to work Okay, we got to improve the governance. He was undoing the Banking Act of 1935, which was written to give Mariner Eccles, as chairman of the Fed, the power oh, sure. that Eccles wanted. Okay, and this, is, he, this is Hamilton so and Jefferson. So he again. Has, just, he's had uh, right. but 90 I think, years. He's had 90 years of that. Maybe that's enough. I think you talk to Charlie Plosser or, or Jeff Lacker or, or, um, or even Charlie Evans. I mean, they, would, they, they all see that there is a real strength of having... Um, a number of, of presidents of regional Federal Reserve Banks from around the country coming from different perspectives, coming to D.C., sitting at the table, making those decisions. And all I'm trying to say here is part of what's gone wrong is more and more concentration of responsibility and authority into one chair and one vice chair. And if they blow it, then the taxpayers end up with trillions of dollars in bills. Okay, let's open it up. Uh, I'll go back to Arnold to start with, and then. Uh, I wanted to raise a couple of public choice questions. One is, you know, in terms of solving supervisory and regulatory problems, um, I, can you do that within a, a system in which you expect government discipline rather than market discipline? Because if you're a government official, extend and pretend is always going to be a, appeal a lot. And then the second public choice question is, <laughs> does, are we at an equilibrium in which the banks and the government are both pretty happy? They're propping each other up and 
uh, you know, it's a good deal for the banks to have, uh, you know, sort of their failures and risks covered by the government, and it's a good deal for the government to have, to be able to channel credit to itself. Um, <laughs> so don't, you know, isn't this a kind of a stable equilibrium? Okay, Charlie, take the first crack. Be quick, though, because we want to get some more questions in, please. I think those are great questions. Uh, and it, it's because I think your second question could be right, that your first question is all the more meaningful. That is, can we establish any kind of credible government regulation and supervision, given the conflicted incentives of government officials? And I think the answer is we can. And the, the key, which I've been pointing to, and many others for over 25 years, is that we have to have market variables as part of the regulatory and supervisory toolkit, because that requires the supervisors and regulators to be responsive to things that everyone is seeing in the market. And that the reason supervisors and regulators don't want to incorporate market uh, signals into the supervisory regulatory framework is because it would eliminate their discretion to avoid dealing with problems. So I, my point is, if we can pass that, we can make regulatory and supervisory decisions much more responsive. I want to say, if I could, uh, Paul, um, extend and pretend is uh, to Arnold's point is always very tempting to anybody, including government officials. And sometimes extend and pretend works. It worked, for example, for Paul Volcker during the 1980s with the sovereign debt crisis, where they put off for about seven years uh, a, any recognition of the, of the deep losses that already existed. So it might work. It's extend and pretend did not work for the Federal Home Loan Bank Board in the 1980s when they tried it with the thrifts and it collapsed instead. So it's, a very, it's very tempting uh, always, and, and uh, I suppose uh, a matter of judgment as you go through these stages, as I think about it, of the, of, of the crisis, uh, happy talk uh, and confidence, and then extend and pretend before you go on to other things. Um, the only other point I would add is that since, of course, the government always wants to borrow from the banking system, it's one of the reasons to have a banking system, the easiest way is the Fed itself. And the Fed's first mandate is one that is not on their, uh, on their website. It is to finance the government uh, as needed. And the old language for that was to maintain an orderly market in treasury securities. That meant finance the government as needed. And that's the, the real first thing, in my opinion, that all central banks exist to provide. Good. Right over here first, and then Bert. Thanks. First, let me, this was a great panel. I love the point about the uh, money market funds that we're all probably invested in being a run for the, for the future. And Mr. Nelson, your point that we had this process called stress tests which were absolutely central to the Fed ish sending a message of confidence to the public. And now you tell us that they completely disregarded the risk, the risk of a sudden rise in interest rates. I mean, it almost makes me want to laugh. It reminds me of how much they encouraged the banks to own Freddie and Fannie securities before 2007. <laughs> so it's pretty hard to criticize the bankers <laughs> if you've got this going on at the Fed. Now, question for Alex Pollack. You know, on Saturday, we had the Berkshire Hathaway meeting, and Warren Buffett made the uh, statement, as he often does, which is, look, banking is fine if you just follow sound banking principles. And I also, this is largely echoed on the panel here. All we need is fix this, fix this, fix that. Your approach is more, no, there's a paradox at the heart of banking. Really, the whole thing is kind of a subsidy to business or whatever. Do you have a concept of a well-managed, sound bank? How would they finance themselves? Through bonds? 
or I don't know, greater use of CDs, that's not a fail safe. Hertz net interest margin, do you have thoughts on that? I do, I, uh, uh, I think, a, uh, first of all, a sound bank would be much more boring. You know, uh, my old friend Hyman Minsky of Minsky Moment fame used to say the whole, the whole world should be a balance between entrepreneurs and bankers. He, he told me one time, the, uh, the entrepreneurs are warm, optimistic, able to, in their own minds to leap tall buildings in a single bound, do anything. The bankers are supposed to be cold, pessimistic, always focused on what can go wrong instead of what can go right. And so he said, you have to have this balance. Well, that means the bankers are conservative. But what happens when the entrepreneur takes over the bank, which inevitably happens, like, for example, in these failed banks? that we have just uh, experienced this year. So the, 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 the old uh, conservative bank would follow Badgett's rule that banking should be easy. If it's hard, it's wrong. Uh, but it, but it, it's bound not to happen in a certain number of cases. Uh, I want to, uh, Bonnie, if you'll remind me of your email, I'll send you my paper on the money bank and the credit bank. The money bank would be very conservative, very sound. The credit bank could, could do other, would be not so conservative, but its investors would all be totally at risk, and there should never be a bailout of the credit bank, in my view, and I'll, I'll finally just uh, remind you of a, of a great chapter title from Badgett's Lombard Street, which is, why Lombard Street is usually very boring, but sometimes very excited. <laughs> and that sums it up, doesn't it? Okay, Charlie, let's go to Bert and let Bert ask a question. And we'll... uh, th thank you very much. Uh, a quick <laughs> observation and a question. Uh, the observation, uh, if you look at SVP and its balance sheet, it essentially was stru structured and financed like a 1980s SNL. It was liabilities were largely overnight money in form of MMDAs. And of course, it took long-term ter interest rate risk on mortgages and mortgage-backed uh, securities. So the fact that it failed in a raising the rate environment, hardly a surprise. Uh, my question is this. It was a surprise to some people, apparently. Well, it shouldn't have been a surprise to any <laughs> of you. It shouldn't have been, um, I agree. <laughs> but, uh, okay, my, my question is, the FDIC is the depositor insurer, or was the depositor insurer of SVP. They're taking a huge loss. Were the FDIC's insurance premiums, which supposedly are risk-based, sufficiently risk-based, is possibly part of the problem of unsound banking today is that the insurer, i.e. the FDIC, does not have properly structured, properly priced deposit insurance. I, I think that's certainly true. They, um, the uh, concentrations uh, they allowed in very large uninsured deposit accounts, that, that's not on any of their large bank pricing. That is not a, a large bank pricing thing that, that shows up in their, in their uh, premium assessments. Uh, they, they do, there, there are measures of liquidity, but, but nothing as simple as looking at <clears throat> deposits and seeing that 90% of them are way over the deposit insurance limit. I mean, the average account at SBB was something like $3 billion. But what about the interest rate they were taking? To what extent, in fact, I know what the answer is, they, the S the FDIC's risk, supposedly risk-based pricing formula does not take into account the type of interest rate risk that oh, oh, SVP's only, only through Only through the CAMELS rating. So the extent that the S, the market sensitivity, the risk is somehow measured right in CAMELS 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, uh, then it would, it would take into account interest rate risk. But I, I grant you that that's not... Obviously, that didn't work very well in these cases since all of these banks were CAMELS 2 or so. Yes, Charlie. And, and in this case, Bert, the, the loss of capital was so sudden that, and the bank was so undercapitalized and insolvent that I don't think the pricing of deposit insurance, even if it had responded very rapidly, would have been able to solve the problem. So I agree with you that better pricing would be an improvement, but I don't think it could solve this kind of sudden depletion of, of equity. Even because the increase would have happened uh, too late to really uh, deal with the problem. Anybody else want to weigh in or go for another question? Well, I would just endorse more or less what Alex has been recommending. 
Um, and this again, why I think a properly designed central bank digital currency isn't really so different from the original narrow bank proposal that came out of the Chicago School. Um, it just has to be done by um, you know, private institutions. I think it would be totally irresponsible probably for the central bank to actually be doing transactions directly with the public. It's just too dangerous. <laughs> that information you know, could easily be misused, right? So you need the firewall of private institutions that are holding wallets for people, okay? But what we call the narrow bank um, is essentially a wallet where a customer, which could be a small bank or an individual person, a family, or a bigger company, can put money into that wallet and 100% of it's held at the central bank and instantly and free um, whenever that um, customer wants money from their wallet to pay for something, it's just transferred back out of the, um, of the reserve account at the central bank into the wallet and then to the, to the payee. Um, and the advantage of that system is you don't need deposit insurance anymore and you don't have to figure out the right, the right premiums. Okay, there's none of this supervision and regulation stuff. It's simple. Okay, the only thing you have to make sure is that the, you know, um, that it's essentially instant from the point at which the, pay, the, the account, the wallet holder wants to make a payment, it's practically instant that the funds are transferred from the central bank into the wallet and then to the payee. Okay, that's the only but, moment of risk. But it, but it cuts the lending function out. No more don't time? Sue lends anymore to businesses. Okay, but then the, what, what I think Alex was talking about is the credit institutions, okay? I would just call those um, limited partnerships or or S one you know S corporations or 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 or, or, or publicly traded firms. Um, I don't see it as any different at all from Tesla or 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 General Motors. Okay, um, there's shareholders, there's creditors. Okay, and it's all buyer beware, and there's some transparency regulations, and maybe the SEC has to strengthen those transparency. But there's no deposit insurance. We we don't have any deposit government deposit insurance for um, at least I would I was going to say we don't have any deposit insurance for General Motors, but actually it turned out we did. We just <laughs> we didn't realize we didn't realize. We actually, had certainly for the union, union pension, pension funds. Yeah. Okay, but I hope we don't have any deposit insurance for Tesla. Okay, if that company is mismanaged, uh, the investors will lose. Okay, and, I th and so I think the distinction that would greatly simplify and 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 solve to some extent the this fundamental paradox that Alex referred to is one thing is extremely simple and it's safe and it's what some people want. The household, they don't have a financial advisor, <laughs> they don't have a financial plan, they just need a, a transaction account to put their money where they know it's gonna be there a week later when they need to pay the rent, okay? And this kind of digital ball would satisfy that. Um, same for a small company, the barbershop or something, it would just solve that problem. And everyone else has to think about where are they gonna put their money and keep track, and what Charlie was saying before about the market incentives, the market monitoring, I forgot what you called it, Charlie, but the, you know, the, the, um, you know, the, the, the market participants have to be aware of who are they lending the money to, and it's on them, because it's not collateralized. There's one thing to add as a criterion is that that money account must be non-interest bearing. It cannot be viewed as an investment or a return. And I think if the otherwise Fed, it if won't the, work. Otherwise, you'll really destroy the credit system as just as Paul okay, said. Okay. If, if the Federal Reserve is achieving price stability, and I would even say <laughs> but, true price stability, which means zero. What, what year is that going to happen, uh, Andy? Oh, okay. <laughs> but then we're back to these governance issues, okay? And probably as soon as the GAO report comes out. Look, you know that bureaucrats don't want to ever shrink their agency. They never do. I was there in one for 20 years. I know this, okay? And so the Federal Reserve, I think you said this, Alex, right? They've always managed to keep expanding the size, okay? But uh, and part of the problem here with creating this sort of narrow bank arrangement um, is um, that whole function of the Federal Reserve, you know, might shrink to, you know, some relatively minuscule size. <laughs> they panic, like, what are we going to do without all that function? So, so could I do, offer an alternative view yeah, on this? Climate, they're going to be doing climate change stress testing. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, um, so, yeah, you know, there's, there's a reason why for 
centuries, millennia, the combination of deposit taking and loan making has been combined. There are important complementarities between those two things. Charlie has articulated one of the leading uh, explanations for why this is true. Depositors are, are important canaries in the coal mine for, for banks enforcing discipline. There are other reasons why it, it's true, Loretta. Mester has, has emphasized the ability of banks to monitor their, the people to whom they've lent money when they take their deposits. There's a lot of reasons for this. And the provision of credit by banks to the US economy is crucial for growth. I mean, there's a reason why the financial stability report of the Fed that was just released listed as the number one concern that macroeconomic activity would be curtailed by a reduction in. So as we contemplate this new world where we come to understand that deposits can, can leave a bank much more quickly than we thought, unless we want to end up in a world where we just have narrow banks and the banks are basically government-only money funds that invest and if we're going to give up on the, on the growth that comes from having lending by banks, I'd like to, to articulate a different idea. There's really only one way, there's only one entity that can provide instant credit, uh, instant funds, and that's the central bank. And you can either have the banks have to keep all their extra HQLA on the bank as a reserve balances, in which case you're going to have a $20 trillion Federal Reserve to meet all of these things. Or you can have the Federal Reserve do its job and be a lender of last resort. And you can have banks continue to make loans to Main Street, to you know, consumer loans, business loans, and as they do now, pledge those loans to the central bank. And then have the bank offer lines of credit to the Fed for which the banks would pay a fee. This would be self, this would not be, this, banks would be continuing to self-insure, they would pay a fee for these lines of credit from the central bank and the banks could keep being banks and that would be their source of liquidity. And this is very close to the idea that was just articulated by Paul Tucker in the Financial Times, by Mervyn King, and it's already built into the, the Basel III requirement in the LCR that just needs to be refined to some extent. And the Fed needs a new source of uh, profit so they can sell their liquidity. That well, the, all those profits are, yeah, it'll help, it'll help boost the situation so. I think Charlie is either wants to. Okay, we got two minutes left. Oh no, you have a. I think he's going to agree with me, so I want him to speak. Oh. Okay, uh, Charlie, we got. Go ahead, quick. So uh, I just wanted to agree with Bill that I don't. I think Alex, of course, is right. We'll never have a riskless uh, system. But if you look uh, at the history of banking, in fact, some countries have never had a banking crisis. The country north of us, Canada. They've had some bank failures, but they've been typically small, and we can deal with that. If you have a combination of a, a capital regulatory system that's responsive, that forces banks to deal with losses of capital on a timely basis, and you combine it, as Bill said, with a proper rules-based lender of last resort to deal with liquidity issues, you have, it, that's a pretty good technology. There may be reasons to change that over time, and fintech is challenging some of those models. But I agree with Bill that that is not hopeless. Okay, Ona, quick, quickly, please. Um, Andrew, you have a you need microphone a there, Una. Oh, Andrew, first of all, um, it might be useful in your campaign to look at the UK Bank of England with its court of directors and external mm -hmm. auditors, mm -hmm. typically. Additionally, the ECB, with mm -hmm. its operational report to the European Court of Auditors as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe America can learn something from older countries. <laughs> I hesitate to suggest that. Um, Alex, I want to ask, given that interest rate is the only tool for dealing with inflation, how come the central bankers did not notice the effects of the Russia-Ukraine war on the supply of grain to the rest of the world doesn't note the real climate change risk, which is the rapid increase in electricity um, provided by fossil fuels, which of course affects the price of everything in the world. Or does he think central bankers should adopt what one of the bank officials, chief officials said recently, to the from his half a million pounds a year salary, you have to note that we're all going to be poorer now. <laughs> well, like uh, Una, I think central banks seconds. did think about uh, all all that, and it's uh, we're up against the forecasting problem, and 
The central bank's forecasts are just as bad as the forecasts of all the rest of us, including notably my forecasts. <laughs> and, and that's part of the reality that goes into this whole interacting uh, system, as I said, of banks and central banks and regulators of, of all kind um, influencing each other, including uh, on the, in, on the uh, inflation front. On inflation, of course, there is one party which greatly benefits from inflation. That's the, the biggest debtor there is. That's the government itself. And, uh, and part, of, part of financing the government is providing enough inflation to make the, uh, the uh, government debt sustainable without um, letting the real interest rates get too high, keeping them low. And, and central banks do work on that. Okay, just just quick, we've got to oh, wrap I, up. Oh, it can be quick. Um, so yes, I think the Bank of England um, is a role model. No institution's perfect, okay? But one remarkable contrast in the last year is the FMC has been unanimous on every single decision, even some ones that you would think that reasonable people would disagree about and where there's tough judgment calls. Um, in the Bank of England, they've had a lot of dissents at every single meeting, okay? And I think that's healthy, actually. Um, if, if there was no independent watchdog in the United States, then I think Congress could do something kind of like the Court of Directors and the Independent Evaluation Office at the Bank of England. I think it's, it's not a bad design. But we already have watchdogs that Congress created in the 70s, and those watchdogs just need to be given authority to do comprehensive reviews. Fully independent IG at the Fed, and a GAO that does comprehensive audits. Okay, with that, I, I have to wrap up. It's 12, a little bit over 12.30. So thank, I want to thank the panelists for excellent uh, discussion and comments. They did a great job. Charlie, thanks for uh, sticking with us there. Um, and thank you guys all for staying. And um, hope to see you again soon at, a, at an event in the future. Thanks. Thank you.